over $3.50 a gallon in the U.S. Earlier, a House committee looked at those rising prices and ways U.S. energy policy might be changed to address the issue, including increases in domestic production. Witnesses included the current head of the U.S. Energy Information Administration, as well as a former chief at that agency. Washington State Republican Doc Hastings chairs this two-and-a-half-hour hearing. The chair announces the presence of a quorum. Today, the Committee on Natural Resources is meeting to hear testimony on harnessing American resources to create jobs and address rising gasoline prices, domestic resources, and economic impacts. Under Rule 4F, opening statements are limited to the chairman, the ranking member of the committee, so that they can hear from our, so we can hear from our witnesses more clearly. So I ask unanimous consent that any member that desires to have an opening statement and a record uh, shall be granted, without objection, so ordered. Chair will recognize himself for an opening statement. Every American is feeling the pain from rising gasoline prices. There's no escaping it. It costs more to drive to work, costs more to run errands, it costs more to take the kids to school. Even those who don't own a car are paying more for groceries and other goods because of the transportation costs to get products to market. The Natural Resources Committee has jurisdiction over all federal lands, both onshore and offshore. This is where the majority of Americans' energy reserves are located and also where the Obama administration has done the most to block energy production. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine how to harness these energy resources on federal lands to help create jobs and address the issue of rising gasoline prices. A recent report from the Congressional Research Service de detailed just how large our energy reserves are in the United States. Our combined recoverable oil, natural gas, and coal resources total 1.3 trillion barrels of oil equivalent, the largest in the world, more than Saudi Arabia, China, and Iran. And this figure doesn't even account for our vast oil shale reserves in the West, which the U.S. Geological Survey estimates to be greater than one and a half trillion barrels of oil. The best way for the United States to insulate themselves long term from unpredictable world events and rising gasoline prices is to produce more energy here at home. We have the resources to produce our own energy and we have the best and latest technology to accomplish it safely. But for some baffling reason, this administration is to choosing not to do so. Since the President's early days, earliest days in office, his administration has blocked, delayed, hindered, and obstructed energy production across America from coast to coast, onshore and offshore, all the way to Alaska. This administration has canceled leases in Utah, delayed oil shale production in Colorado, imposed a de facto moratorium on the Gulf of Mexico, blocked offshore energy in both the Atlantic and Pacific coasts, retroactively withdrew a permit for a coal mine in West Virginia, blocked energy production on tribal lands throughout the country, and impeded both onshore and offshore production in Alaska, and the list goes on and on. All of these actions cost American jobs and lead, lead to higher gasoline and energy costs. Incredibly, the President and the White House have been telling a very different story. But their rhetoric doesn't match reality. The White House has even been touting statistics on increased U.S. oil production. But they are trying to claim credit for actions that took place long before President Obama took office. An increase in oil production today is the result of pro-energy policies of previous administrations, not this one. Less production, higher gasoline prices, jobs being shipped overseas, and deeper dependence on foreign countries, these are the real results of this administration's policies. I'm a firm believer in expanding all types of American energy, from solar and wind to hydro and biomass. However, Oil and natural gas and coal are integral parts of our daily lives and are used for far more than just fuel and transportation. They enable millions of Americans to heat their homes in the winter. They are essential ingredients in producing plastics, tires, farm fertilizers, computers, and other high-tech devices. Even Blackberries and iPhones that members and staff can never seem to put down are in this category. 
I announced yesterday my intention to do to introduce bills that will help produce more energy by putting uh, people in the Gulf back to work and reversing this President's offshore drilling ban. These uh, will be the first of several bills that will be introduced. We are working on an array of specific proposals that will be introduced as part of the American Energy Institute. So really it all comes down to one very simple choice. Do we want to produce our energy here in America and create American jobs, or do we want to jeopardize our national security by deepening our reliance on foreign countries for energy? To me, the answer is not a difficult one. So with that, uh, since the, uh, I see the minority uh, has, uh, they have, I know some of their members are uh, not here. In fact, I know, now know why. One of the member, the ranking members on the floor of the House, I see. So, modern innovation has allowed me to see that. Uh, you don't see it, but I see it. <laughs> and so, when he um, uh, when he comes uh, back, uh, we will we will give him uh, the opportunity to uh, to make his uh, statement. Uh, I'm advised that we're going to have votes here uh, in as short as 10 minutes. That happens uh, in this process. But I want to call the first panel, and I see they are seated. We have the Honorable Richard G. Newell, Administrator of the U.S. Energy Information Administration, Ms. Brenda Price, the Energy Resources Coordinator for the U.S. Ge Geological Survey, Mr. Gene Whitney, Manager of the uh, Energy Research Congressional Research Service, uh, Dr. Michelle uh, Michel Foss, Chief Energy Economist, University of Texas, Mr. Guy Caruso, Senior Advisor, Energy and National Security, Center for Strategic and International Studies, and Mr. Frank uh, Rusco, or Rusco? Rusco. I had two choices, and I missed the first one there. Director of Energy and Science Issues for the, uh, for the GAO. So we'll proceed with our uh, panel right now. At, uh, and I'd like to recognize uh, Richard Newell. Uh, and I, I might mention that under the rules that we have here, we have a timing mechanism there. Your full statement will appear uh, in the record, but I would like to uh, ask you if you would keep your uh, oral testimony to uh, five minutes. When the uh, green light is on, it means you have up to four minutes. When the yellow light goes on, there's 30 seconds, and the red light goes on, I'd ask you to, uh, to uh, uh, close up your remarks if you could. So, Mr. Newell, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you and the committee today. Uh, the Energy Information Administration is the statistical and analytical agency within the U.S. Department of Energy. EIA does not promote or take positions on policy issues and has independence with respect to the information and analysis we provide. Therefore, our views should not be construed as representing those of the Department of Energy or other federal agencies. Starting with the near-term outlook for oil and gasoline markets, EIA expects continued tightening of world oil markets over the next two years, particularly in light of recent events in North Africa and the Middle East, the world's largest oil-producing region. Our latest forecast, issued earlier this month, projects that regular gasoline at the retail pump will average $3.70 per gallon this summer and $3.56 per gallon for the entire year, which is about 77 cents per gallon higher than last year's level. There is significant, re significant regional variation in gasoline prices, and there's also significant uncertainty surrounding these forecasts, as discussed in my written testimony. In considering how energy markets might be affected by the issues being considered in this hearing, it is important to recognize important differences in the markets for oil and natural gas. The prices of oil and gasoline produced from it generally, generally reflect conditions on the world oil market including the global balance between supply and demand and concerns related to actual and potential supply disruptions. In contrast, the price of natural gas is largely determined by the balance of supply and demand in North America. For this reason, I will address natural gas and oil separately, starting with natural gas. In 2010, overall U.S. natural gas production increased while prices were generally stable. We expect these trends to continue, although natural gas prices can be volatile, often due to weather-related events. The current U.S. natural gas market reflects the tremendous growth in shale gas production, which more than doubled between 2008 and 2010, and in 2010 represented 22 percent of total natural gas production in the United States. U.S. proved reserves of natural gas grew by over 63 percent in the last decade and have now reached the highest level since 1971. 
EIA sees considerable potential for continued growth in shale gas production, with shale gas projected to supply nearly half of U.S. natural gas production by 2035. EIA's 2011 Annual Energy Outlook Reference Case, which assumes the continuance of current laws and regulations, projects a continued increase in natural gas production over the next 25 years, with U.S. net imports of natural gas expected to fall from 11 percent of consumption in 2010 to only about 1 percent of consumption by 2035. Because domestic shale gas resources are located primarily under private and state lands, we would not expect access issues on federal lands to have a major effect on our projections for U.S. natural gas production, reserves, or prices. Let me now turn to issues surrounding oil production and markets. When considering the effects of changes in future oil production, it is important to recognize that resource access does not typically translate into immediate or near-term production. In addition, the impact on mar market prices depends not only on the magnitude and timing of actual production flows, but also on the magnitude relative to global liquid supply, which is currently about 88 million barrels per day. In the short term, oil markets react, constantly react to many competing factors in a global context, and it is extremely difficult to disentangle the near-term impact of mid- to long-term developments in the context of oil markets that see typical daily price movements of, in the range of 1 to 2 percent and much higher fluctuations at times. Long term, we would not expect additional volumes of oil that could flow from resources on federal lands due to greater access to have a large impact on oil and gasoline prices. This is due to the globally integrated nature of the world oil market and the more significant long-term responsiveness of oil demand and supply to price movements compared to short-term responsiveness. Given the increasing importance of OPEC supply in the global oil supply and demand balance, another key issue is how OPEC production would respond to any increase in non-OPEC supply, potentially offsetting any direct price effect of increased U.S. production. Of course, greater domestic crude oil production, no matter what the cause, be it increased development, higher resource potential in current known fields, or wider application of advanced technology would impact local economic activity and net oil imports. My written testimony provides additional information on EIA's resource estimates and projections. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, this concludes my testimony. I'd be happy to answer any questions. That is absolutely perfect timing, Mr. Newell. I, uh, <laughs> if that is a template for how we're going to do this, this is going to be a wonderful hearing. <laughs> thank you very, thank you very much. Now the pressure, pressure is on Ms. Pierce. <laughs> Ms. Pierce, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear here today to discuss with you the U.S. Geological Survey's role in studying, understanding, and assessing domestic energy resources. The USGS conducts scientific investigations and assessments of geologically based energy resources, including conventional and unconventional resources. The mission of the USGS Energy Resources Program is to understand the processes critical to the formation, accumulation, occurrence, and alteration of geologically based energy resources, to conduct scientifically robust assessments of those resources, and to study the impact of energy resource occurrence and or production on the use of both environmental and human health. The results from these scientific studies are used to evaluate the quality and distribution of energy resource accumulations and to assess the energy resource potential of the nation exclusive of the federal offshore waters, that's BOEMRE, and the petroleum resource potential of the world. One important goal of USGS domestic energy activities is to conduct research and assessments of undiscovered, technically recoverable oil and natural gas resources of the United States exclusive of the federal outer continental shelf. The amount of undiscovered, technically recoverable resources changes over time because of advances in geologic understanding, changes in technology and industry practices, and other factors. This necessitates that resource assessments be periodically updated to take into account such advances. Recent examples include the USGS assessment of the Bakken Formation in the U.S. portion of the Williston Basin. This assessment, released in 2008, shows an estimated 3 to 4.3 billion barrels of undiscovered, technically recoverable oil compared to the USGS 1995 mean estimate of 151 million barrels of oil. Our geologic understanding of this basin evolved since 1995, and significant technological advances redefined what was technically recoverable in 2008 as compared to 1995. Another example is a USGS assessment of gas hydrates on the Alaskan North Slope. 
As a result and advances of our understanding of this emerging resource, the USGS assessment estimates a mean of 85.4 trillion cubic feet of technically recoverable gas from gas hydrates on the Alaska North Slope. Research challenges remain to determine if this technically recoverable resource will be economically recoverable, but current multi-organizational, including the USGS, and multidisciplinary efforts are focusing on overcoming these obstacles. The USGS is conducting a systematic inventory of the technically and economically recoverable coal resources of the significant mineable coal beds in the United States to provide a comprehensive estimate of how much of the nation's coal endowment is actually accessible for development and available under certain market conditions and mining constraints. The first basin being assessed is the Powder River Basin of Wyoming and Montana. The USGS assessment of the Powder River Basin will be the most thorough and comprehensive inventory of the nation's most significant coal basin to date. This inventory, with the others on the schedule, will provide policy and decision makers with important information and valuable planning tools. The USGS also evaluates renewable resources such as geothermal energy. The USGS recently completed a national geothermal resource assessment, the first one in more than 30 years. The USGS assessment results indicate that full development of conventional identified systems could expand geothermal power production by about 260% of the currently installed geothermal total in the United States. The estimate for unconventional enhanced geothermal systems, or EGS, is more than an order of magnitude larger than the combined estimates of both identified and undiscovered conventional geothermal resources. If successfully developed, EGS could provide an installed geothermal electric power generation capacity equivalent to about half of the currently installed electric power generating capacity of the U.S. <clears throat> energy resources research and assessments are a traditional strength of the USGS. As a nation's energy mix evolves, and USGS will continue to seek ways to expand its research and assessment portfolio to better include a comprehensive suite of energy resources. USGS resources Resource assessments and research can provide valuable information for the public and government discourse about the energy resource future of the nation. The USGS looks forward to working with Congress and examines these challenges and opportunities. Thank you for this opportunity to provide an overview of USGS research and assessments of geologically based energy resources, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, boy, this is an all-star panel right now, I'll tell you. <laughs> Next, uh, Dr. Jean Whitney, the energy research, or ener from Energy Research at the Congressional Research Service. You are recognized, sir, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, on behalf of the Congressional Research Service, I would like to thank the committee for its invitation to testify today to address the subject of rising gasoline prices and domestic resources. Domestic energy production contributes to the economic vitality of the nation and reduces reliance on foreign energy sources. Much of our domestic energy production takes place on federal lands or on federally owned outer continental shelf. Congress has worked hard to ensure that resources developed on federal lands provide revenues to the American people through lease purchase, rents, and royalties. But energy production, like many industrial processes, involves some risk to human health and safety and to environmental quality. Thus, numerous laws have been passed in recent decades to ensure that energy production in the United States is done in a safe and responsible manner. Policies have been established through statute and through federal agency rulemaking to provide controlled access to federal lands and to regulate the activities of energy production. The purpose of my testimony today is to describe the responsibilities and authorities of the federal land management agencies, and through that description, to outline the processes that energy companies must navigate in order to explore for, develop, and produce oil in the United States. There is an ongoing tension between the expansion of energy production in which companies seek access to federal lands and waters to find and produce oil, and regulation by federal agencies to ensure that exploration and production proceeds safely and with minimal environmental impact. This tension has been especially high in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon event. Access to onshore federal lands for energy exploration and production is managed primarily by the Interior Department's Bureau of Land Management and by the U.S. Forest Service and the Department of Agriculture. Resources on the federal out outer continental shelf are managed by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regulation and Enforcement in the Department of the Interior. 
each of these agencies develops land use plans and resource management plans that determine how and when federal lands and offshore areas are developed. The plans for onshore development seek to accommodate varied uses of public lands, including energy and minerals development, grazing, recreational activities, timber harvesting, and preservation of wildlife habitat and waterways, among others. Offshore development must coexist with fisheries, shipping, recreational activities, and preservation of marine ecosystems. Resource management plans are developed with public input and must comply with the requirements of the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, air and water quality regulations, and several other applicable statutes and regulations. Each resource management plan includes a schedule of energy and mineral leases for the planning units. Leases for oil and gas on federal lands and offshore are sold at public auction. The winning bid for a particular parcel purchases the lease and gains the right to produce oil and gas from the lease area. The leaseholder must pay rent on the lease lands and royalties are paid on any oil and gas produced. A portion of these royalties is shared with the states. The owner of a lease must obtain a permit to drill on the lease. The permitting process is also guided by a number of laws and regulations, including several new requirements instituted by the Interior Department after the Deepwater Horizon incident. The process of approval of an application for a permit to drill is affected by the ability of federal agencies to process the application, as well as the ability of the permit applicant to meet the requirements for approval. Other non-procedural issues may delay or prevent oil and gas development from proceeding on a particular lease, including a shortage of drilling rigs or other equipment, a shortage of skilled labor, or issues associated with the company's financial strategy. Legal challenges against the government or against the energy company might also delay or prevent development on federal leases. In summary, the process of leasing federal lands and waters the approval of permits to drill and the logistics of exploration and production are lengthy and complex processes subject to a large number of laws and regulations which make simple characterizations of the overall process difficult. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this information on behalf of the Congressional Research Service. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Boy, that's, this is, this, this is, uh, I, I have to tell you, I am absolutely impressed with these three witnesses that have hit it right on the mark. We've got to come up with an award, I think, for, for that. If the chairman would yield, we should point out, that as these witnesses come in on time with their testimony, we judge testimony on both content <laughs> and, qual and quality. And, and on both scores, they are doing well. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you said that, Mr. Holt, because the next person to, uh, to testify is the ranking member uh, who, <laughs> who wasn't here. Uh, we have been called to, to vote, but we have time, and I want to give the courtesy to uh, Mr. Markey to make his opening statement. And then we will break, uh, come, uh, go to the vote, and then uh, come back. So, Mr. Markey, uh, follow uh, Mr. Rush's lead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and happy St. Patrick's Day uh, to you, uh, Mr. Chairman. The, um, the reference in the title of this hearing to harnessing American resources is appropriate because we are in a horse race. But rather than a blanket of roses at the finish line, the winner gets much more valuable prizes, lower unemployment and lower energy prices for American families. There are two horses in this race. The old horse, the one that has been running flat out for decades, is Drill Baby Drill. That horse is owned by a syndicate of the richest international oil companies in the world and OPEC. The second horse, a much more recent entry in the race, is Clean Energy. That horse is owned by the American people in partnership with researchers, investors, and companies developing new technologies to produce energy from wind, solar, geothermal, hydropower, biomass, and other renewable sources. Now our Republican colleagues make plenty of claims about this race, but their handicapping is highly suspect. First, they say they want a fair race and claim they would be happy to see both horses win. This is their all-of-the-above claim. But the truth is, our Republican friends have taken a terrible risk. They have bet it all on just one horse. 
They bet billions of dollars in subsidies and tax breaks, not to mention betting our economy and our future, all on drill, baby, drill. In this committee alone, the scorecard on all of the above stands at seven hearings featuring drill, baby, drill, and zero on clean energy. The Republican majority also claims that the Obama administration is pulling back the reins on drill, baby, drill. The truth is, this administration is riding that horse as hard and as fast as ever. Republicans want to debate permits or acres or 10-year projections, but let's just cut to the chase. The amount of oil and natural gas produced from our public lands has gone up every year of the Obama administration, period. In fact, we have been riding this horse so long and so hard that we have left every other country far behind. Nobody has as much riding on drill, baby drill, as we do. And lastly, our Republican colleagues claim that drill, baby drill can win this race. The truth is that despite the long head start and despite the uneven field and despite all the money we have been riding on that hoss, history has proven that drill, baby drill will never get us to the finish line. That horse has given us everything it has, more barrels of oil, more cubic feet of natural gas, more acres under lease, more permits to drill, and no matter what we do, no matter how many subsidies or tax breaks we give, the price at the pump remains beyond our control. The harder we whip that horse, the further away the finish line seems. At some point, we have to face facts. The Republican energy policy amounts to nothing more than beating a dead horse. So what might happen if we get serious and let clean energy out of the gate? Well, the first thing you need to know is that clean energy can catch up because it is incredibly fast. Just think about the speed of the arrival of the internet or the elapsed time between the rotary dial phone and the iPhone when this country puts its mind to something. The speed of innovation will take your breath away. And unlike drill, baby, drill, the longer we let clean energy run, the cheaper it gets. There's a Moore's law for solar that says each time we double production, the cost of solar panels drops 18%. The investment we make in this horse stands to be the best bet we have ever made. The most important clean energy we can win, that can win, uh, the, the, the most important uh, is that clean energy can win this race. While drill, baby, drill runs in place, clean energy is moving forward. This horse will create new jobs, American jobs, developing American technology. And this horse can cut energy prices by reducing our oil imports. If we unleash clean energy, let her out of the starting gate, we will find ourselves in the winner's circle in no time as a country looking over our shoulders at number two and three in the world. That is our opportunity. And that is the conclusion of my opening statement with 17 seconds left to spare. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. You were, you were up to that challenge that was offered by Mr. Holt, and I thank the ranking member for that. We have two votes. Uh, the committee will stand in recess until approximately uh, 11 o'clock. Hopefully we can do it before that, but uh, no later than 11 o'clock. Committee stands in recess. The committee will reconvene and uh, we'll continue with our, uh, our panel and I want to thank uh, all of you for uh, bearing with us while we had uh, votes on the floor. So to introduce uh, Dr. Foss, the Chief Energy Economist at the University of Texas. Dr. Foss, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and thanks members of the committee for once again inviting me to serve as a witness. Hydrocarbons are exceptional commodities. They improve living standards, improve quality of life. They're challenging to They are commodities, and so prices are variable. Prices are variable for many reasons, including actions and events. We're in a time in which events are creating expectations about prices, and that leaves us with a number of questions. What do we do about this? How do we manage it? 
what kinds of things can we think about. To me, one of the most important things is to ensure that the domestic industry and production remain competitive. And this is a broad charter for both the industry and government. A good way to start is by understanding the industry business cycles. I view, and, and many people like me tend to view the industry cost structure on the basis of full break-even costs. Not just what it costs to sink a drill bit and drill a well, but to stay in business. All the cash costs that have to be carried by companies in order to do what they do. To hold acreage and inventory, regardless of whether it's public or private leases. To pay for geological uh, and geophysical staffs, engineering staffs. Um, to explore, to do research, until you're finally ready to, to begin to develop um, a drillable prospect. Full break-even finding and development costs are high and have been rising for a number of reasons. Part of it is because of the kinds of resources. They're, they are abundant. Resources are everywhere, but they are expensive. The reservoirs are complex. And so incremental costs of extracting additional barrels or cubic feet of gas from those resources can be expensive. As long as we have a high and rising marginal cost curve, then we will have price variability. So how do we manage that high and rising cost curve? What are the kinds of things that we can do? Um, one is to look at where we can increase production volumes because the more that you can produce for a given dollar invested, the better off you're going to be. Um, natural gas offers one way to do that. We have an abundant natural gas base. It also has a high cost structure at present, but we can already see that improvements being made in terms of bringing costs down. We can understand that costs that companies face are affected by many things, policies, regulations, and, and other issues. We can understand that better that companies need access to resources in order to be able to maintain portfolios of leaseholds that can be used to develop drillable prospects. Replenishing production is an essential part of maintaining competitiveness in the domestic business. Protecting private property rights and ensuring access to private lands is just as important as ensuring access to public lands. Our shale gas plays have succeeded largely because of private mineral ownership and the ability to negotiate uh, access with private mineral owners and develop resources that way. But we have to look at our public lands, especially locations like the Gulf of Mexico, and reach a point in which we can feel comfortable that we can responsibly manage access to those resources, maintain our critical science and technology base for offshore exploration, and continue to uh, push the oil production renaissance that we seem to be having um, in the United States, uh, into the Gulf of Mexico, Bakken shales, and other plays. We can also de-bottleneck the industry. We have a, an interesting situation in which our domestic crude is priced lower than international crudes, and to a large extent it's because of infrastructure. So we need to continue to be able to expand oil and oil product pipelines, not just within the United States, but across our borders. We also need to understand the socioeconomic benefits that the industry provides. Um, and these are large and varied, and it, it includes jobs, not only directly in the industry, but also indirectly through service companies and local investments in procurement. The industry pays taxes. It is actually one of the larger tax-paying entities. I wanted to just draw the committee's attention to a report in the Wall Street Journal that matched our own research on this. Um, the degree to which the petroleum industry pays perhaps up to a third of effective taxes for the United States, much larger than internet-based companies, which um, is interesting to think about since I don't think I can put Facebook in my gasoline tank. The final thing is to just understand better how energy affects transportation systems and the differences between some of the clean energy options we would like to pursue and energy density values in gasoline and diesel. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Foss. Next, we'll go to Mr. Guy Caruso, Senior Advisor for the Energy and National Security Center for Strategic and International Studies. Dr. Or Mr. Caruso, you were recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, uh, all well, members of the committee, and uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity to give my views on the uh, global oil market and the implications for U.S. energy policy. As Dr. Newell mentioned, 
2010 was a very strong year in global oil markets. So we go into this period of now political unrest in North Africa with a fairly strong market. We saw prices break out of a uh, range of $75 to $80 a barrel, which they were in most of last year, to over $90 even before the unrest began. Uh, we saw most forecasters expecting 011 to be a year in which prices would challenge, the, would reach the 90 to $100 range. So this is a strong market we're in. And I think uh, we now have the situation in Libya where about uh, a million barrels a day has been disrupted. Uh, last year, OPEC already began increasing its production to meet increased demand. Non-OPEC supplies were increasing, uh, and that's going to continue. Uh, most forecasters now believe that given the uncertainty about Libya and whether it will spread, are now looking maybe to add 10 or $20 to that price. We've seen already between 5 and $15, depending on your, your views, of a fear premium that's in the oil market. So I think that despite these uh, demonstrations, uh, the most important concern is will this spread to Algeria, where demonstrations have existed, even to places like Saudi Arabia, which so far has been uh, spared any serious uh, disruption. We have the spare capacity to meet that's sufficient to meet these one million barrel a day or so decline in Libya. But if it spread, we would most likely require some further action. And as, uh, as you know, the president uh, has said that the, his administration is prepared to use the SPR should that become necessary. And since the market is adequately supplied right now, I think that's the proper course. But continuing monitoring, continue working with our partners within the IEA and uh, others in the oil producing community is probably the right thing to be doing right now. However, uh, the SPR is a powerful tool should this uh, disruption increase, and it could be used to, A, manage the expectations of further risk, which is out there, and should the uh, disruption expand, uh, may well be necessary in coordination with our partners in the International Energy Agency to use the uh, SPR. Uh, OPEC countries have said they're prepared to add barrels to the market, and Saudi Arabia has already done that. Over the longer term, of course, we have many of the issues that have already been mentioned by the opening statements here in, in both, on both sides of the equation, reducing demand through efficiency and increasing supply. And I think uh, it's important that the U.S. energy policy recognizes this long-term nature of the investments on both sides of the equation that the, Michelle outlined some of them on the supply side. On the demand side, there are a number of things that uh, I think we need to keep doing, especially uh, improving efficiency in automobiles uh, through policies like the CAFE standards and uh, other incentives. Certainly using market mechanisms to incorporate the uh, externalities of both security and environment into the price that we pay, facilitating you know, development of natural resources. Uh, that's important work of this committee. Uh, and I think you know, the infrastructure uh, needed to develop things like Bakken that uh, Brenda Pierce mentioned was such a, a, a potentially large resource for domestic oil and even gas. It's important that those facilities be uh, encouraged Things like uh, imports from Canada should also be encouraged, as well as uh, continuing to uh, improve on the amount of money spent for R&D to lead to the technology and innovation that uh, both of your opening statements indicated would be required. There are many other specifics, but 
I'd like to leave that for the uh, Q&A. And once again, thank you for this opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much, Mr. Crusoe. And, and lastly, we'll go to Mr. Uh, Rusco, Director of the Energy and Science Issues for the Government Accountability Offices. Mr. Rusco, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm pleased to speak with you today about the Department of the Interior's management of oil and gas produced on federal lands and waters in the context of the economic impact of these domestic resources. The Department of the Interior manages the leasing of federal lands and waters for oil and gas exploration, development, and production. These activities provide an important domestic source of energy for the United States, create jobs in the oil and gas industry, and raise revenues that are shared between federal, state, and tribal governments. In general, oil and gas exploration and development activity has been highly correlated with oil and gas prices. Over the past decade, leasing and drilling activity on federal lands and waters and other lands has generally increased. However, during this same period, Interior has found it difficult to strike the right balance between encouraging domestic oil and gas production on one hand and on the other, maintaining operational and environmental safety and providing reasonable assurance that the, public, <clears throat> the public's financial and other interests are being protected. I will focus my remaining remarks on how Interior can improve its management practices and implementation of laws and regulations to provide reasonable assurance that the public interest and the environment are protected and that development of federal lands for oil and gas can continue in a timely and efficient manner to contribute to the nation's economic growth and stability. Interior has struggled to hire, train, and retain enough people with the right skills to keep up with its regulatory responsibilities. For example, in 2005, we reported that BLM staff could not keep up with increased applications to drill. The agency ended up pulling staff that were hired to do National Environmental Protection Act reviews to instead process applications to drill. In 2010, we found that BLM staff were unable to keep up with an increased workload associated with public protests of proposed leases, and that as a result, these approval, <coughs> lease approvals were late, which created uncertainty and additional costs for oil and gas companies. Improving Interior's human capital practices and workforce planning could lead to better protection of the environment, as well as more efficient and timely issuance of leases. Interior does not have a centralized and coordinated process for approving use of new technologies on federal oil and gas leases. At best, this slows down the process for approving new technologies that could improve oil and gas production, and at worst, could prevent good technologies from being deployed or allow inappropriate technologies to be used. Further, <clears throat> Interior has not been consistent across field offices in completing production verification inspections and oversight, leading to uncertainty about whether the public is getting its share of oil and gas revenue. Creating more consistent practices and interpretations of laws and regulations could benefit both the public and oil and gas companies. Revenue collection is a broader concern. In 2008, we reported that Interior had not comprehensively evaluated its revenue collection scheme in over 25 years, despite significant changes in the industry. The current revenue collection scheme is complex, including payments from companies such as bonuses paid for the right to develop a lease, royalties for any oil and gas found, corporate profit and other taxes, and land rents as well as subsidies from the government to oil and gas companies, including royalty relief, tax credits, and favorable depreciation schedules. Interior is currently undertaking a comprehensive study of this system, and we hope there will be ways to simplify and improve this complex scheme so that the public can have confidence it is receiving an appropriate share of revenue and that oil and gas companies continue to view the United States as a desirable place to do business. In conclusion, Regulation and management of federal oil and gas exploration, development, and production should have two important goals. One is to protect the financial and other interests of the public and provide confidence that oil and gas development is safe and environmentally sound. And two, to reduce uncertainty and any unnecessary regulatory burden on the oil and gas industry. Striking the appropriate balance between these two goals is important so that the country can continue to enjoy the economic and strategic benefits of domestic oil and gas production. Thank you. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. 
Thank you, Mr. Rusko. And I, I uh, again, I, I said this uh, earlier, I, I really do thank uh, the panel for their adherence to the time. That is very, very uh, helpful. And as I mentioned, your full statement uh, will appear in the record. Uh, we'll begin questioning, and I will start. And Ms. Pierce, uh, if I could start uh, with you. There's always a lot of discussion about uh, reserves that we have. I remember discussions going way back, and it seems like when the expiration happens, or however it is, the reserves get larger. I'm, I'm saying that very broadly. But where on federal lands or waters, uh, from your research, uh, that uh, currently are, are not open for development are the largest reserves and if you could you uh, you know point out or identify two or three of those so you probably well know there's a difference between resources and reserves reserves are the economic portion of the resource endowment and reserves which is what USGS does is technically recoverable um, some of the largest producers are open and are producing offshore Gulf of Mexico but there are clearly areas offshore, and I don't want to avoid your question, but I want to do it justice. Okay. And so I would actually prefer to defer it, do the research, look at our resource numbers, look at what is off limits, and provide that answer to you in writing. That, that would be up. fine. I, I, we want to get the accurate information, so that's okay. good. Thank you. All right. Well, I, and I was going to uh, ask uh, Dr. Whitney, you, you pointed out Ms. Pierce, the difference between resources and reserves, and I noticed in, in uh, uh, Mr. Whitney's uh, uh, report that they, they talked about that. Could you go more in depth uh, as to the explanation between reserves and resources? Sure. <clears throat> um, reserves are <clears throat> amounts of oil or gas that have been proven to exist through drilling. Um, companies use reserves as sort of an inventory that they will uh, produce at some point in the future. As those reserves are produced, they add new reserves, uh, either through reserve growth in an, in an existing field or through development of new fields. Um, for that reason, reserve values, reserve numbers, tend not to vary wildly. They, they may creep up and down but uh, over time, they don't change very much because these are amounts of oil that, that companies keep in reserve for production. The undiscovered resources are geological estimates in areas that either have not been drilled or uh, include some fields but extend beyond those fields. Uh, those geological estimates are based on uh, several geologic factors within a basin or within a region, <clears throat> such as the existence of a, a source rock that's rich in, in carbon. Uh, the basin must have uh, experienced uh, thermal history sufficient to generate oil or gas, and there must be the existence or potential existence of reservoirs and traps. So <clears throat> there's a comparison made between undiscovered uh, resources in basins and the resources that have been produced in in other basins so there's an estimate that's derived from uh, a statistical treatment of the parameters in the basin compared to uh, known production in other basins so the unde undiscovered technically recoverable resources are a geologic estimate and and by the way the because they're technically recoverable, that number also changes as technologies evolve. Is it fair to say uh, with that comparison then that uh, just in general, the resources, if, if one could quantify that as much larger than the reserves, because you know pretty much what the reserves are. That's right. And the, the reserves uh, tep typically are composed of volumes of oil that are moved from the undiscovered category to reserves and then to production. I guess that's why the uh, uh, you know hearing in the past when people are talking about I mean I'm going back 30 or 40 years the known reserves I think that was the the term used it always seemed to exceed because the resources were tapped therefore the resources kept coming online as you characterize as inventory yeah. so that that's uh, that's that's interesting I, I appreciate that. Uh, my time has, uh, is going to expire before I can get another question in, so I'll yield to the ranking member, Mr. Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my Republican colleagues like 
to say that we are not doing enough drilling here in the United States. And a lot of the numbers that have been tossed around by our witnesses here today can confuse a very fundamental point that I believe that our country must comprehend. We have 2 percent of the world's proven oil reserves. We produce 11 percent of the world's oil uh, on a yearly basis, and we consume 25 percent of the world's oil on a yearly basis. 2 percent of the reserves, 11 percent of the world's oil we produce, 25 percent of the world's oil we consume. Now, I have put together a graphic to help us to tie these numbers together and to help us to understand what they mean. So this uh, is an illustration of our burn rate, or the rate at which our country is producing its reserves. And it compares our burn rate to that of the other top 15 oil producing company, con countries in the world. And what do we learn? Well, no other nation on Earth is matching uh, the burn rate uh, of the United States in terms of consuming their own reserves. Uh, we uh, we uh, consume more than any other nation. Uh, we're burning through our savings, in other words, our reserves, faster than any other country on the planet. Uh, and as you can see, down here in Iraq and Kuwait and Venezuela, the United Arab Emirates, Iran, they have very low burn rates. Okay, so uh, in the long run, uh, this is a chart which obviously is going to cause our country great problems. I guess the first question I would ask to you, Mr. Caruso, is, is this burn rate for our country of our reserves sustainable over the long term, yes or no? Ultimately, we, we will reach the peaking point, and we, we did reach that in 1972 in terms of domestic reserves. How long can it go? It can, it, it can be a very long tail, but clearly we will be, based on anybody's forecast, uh, we'll be, it means we'll be importing a significant amount of oil for as long out as as we can see. So I think Mr. Russo, do you agree? Is this, is this sustainable over the long term, Mr. Russo? No. I mean, unless, unless we discover some new reserves or develop, develop more reserves, uh, you know, we have, it can be sustained, but at, at a declining, uh, yeah. most likely declining. And do you agree, Mr. Russo? Uh, yeah, essentially the, the, Inevitably, um, at, at any rate of, of um, production, we will eventually reach a peak that, that will be followed by a decline. We have, as, as Guy said, reached a peak, but there may be a very long tail. There are a lot of hydrocarbons out there, and we don't know how fast we'll be able to produce them. And which countries on this chart that are the oil-producing countries in the United States, we, uh, in the world, which of these countries benefits in the long run, most from the fast burn rate uh, of the United States in terms of its oil reserves, uh, Mr. Caruso. Well, the uh, OPEC member countries are the ones that have been most uh, determined to manage the, the price. They aren't always successful, but clearly, uh, I would say, in general, OPEC countries are benefiting. Mr. Russo, do you agree with that, Mr. Russo? I guess I would say that, that oil being a, a global commodity, in, in some sense, um, it really doesn't matter where the oil is produced. The, the price is determined by uh, supply and demand globally and um, the benefits and, uh, and costs of that accrue globally. No, but in this context, the the faster we burn down our reserves is the more power in the marketplace those that have massive reserves uh, for the balance of the century uh, will, will have in terms of influencing uh, the, the price in the market since they 
work as a cartel. Would you not agree with that, Mr. Russo? I do agree that at times OPEC has been very successful in managing the price, and, and it, it appears that that is a long-term strategy. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman has expired. I chair recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Fleming. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me say, first of all, I want to compliment uh, this panel because this is some of the most cogent, uh, informative uh, stuff that we've had in a long time here. Uh, you know, we're, we're approaching, in some cases, past $4 a gallon for gasoline. And uh, just as uh, the law of gravity is everything must come down, the same applies to pricing for commodities. It's all about supply and demand. Now, we do see some spikes at times when there are disruptions or even economic issues that may come up. Uh, but in the long term, we know that the real pricing, the underlying pricing trends, are all about supply and demand. And what's interesting is, back to this two-horse analogy where you have alternative energy uh, racing with uh, fossil fuels or hydrocarbons, uh, what we have really seen, particularly in the last five years, is an explosion of discoveries uh, of supplies that we didn't know we had and then also new technologies that we can exploit to get to those that we haven't been able to before. A great example is the Haynesville Shell in my own district that we didn't even know existed five years ago. And now with uh, hydrofracking technology and horizontal drilling, uh, it, it, we have such an abundance, we have trouble getting it out of the ground because it's so cheap. We heard testimony yesterday that the per gallon equivalent of natural gas is like a buck eighty. So it's clear that right now, uh, in, in that two horse race, the hydrocarbon with the exploitation of new technologies and new findings is winning this race. But let me turn to this. Uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke testified on March 1st before the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs, noting that sustained prices. Uh, sustained rises in the prices of oil or other commodities would represent a threat both to economic growth and to overall price stability. Now we hear the Obama administration would rather release oil from the st Strategic Petroleum Reserve uh, when in fact we have, uh, one, as I understand it now, 1.3 trillion barrels of oil equivalent in the ground just here in the United States, which is the largest in the world. So despite some of the, the things that you're hearing here today, information that's coming from your agencies is telling us that we have a lot of stuff that we can use for many years, and that's the whole problem with alternative sources of energy, is it's still not competitive in the marketplace. Why? Because overall, we still have a very abundant supply of energy ahead of us. But what's interesting is in 2008, uh, now, uh, Energy Secretary Chu told the Wall Street Journal that energy prices uh, now uh, Energy Secretary Chu told the Wall Street Journal that energy prices were the linchpin to an over, to an energy overhaul. Somehow we have to figure out how to boost the price of gasoline to the levels of Europe. So we actually have people in Washington here who are working to get that price up when the rest of America is going to the pump and seeing a fifty dollar uh, fill up in their car, jump to $75, and that's crunching the family budget. Uh, so I would just like to have some responses to some of the other panel members uh, today. Uh, just real quickly, how you may respond. Uh, we'll start maybe to the far left over there, to my left, uh, your response to some of these comments and statements that we've heard today. Um. In terms of uh, what, what specific aspect would you like me well, to Well, about, uh, I think you're hearing different versions of what is, what is our ability to be uh, energy independent in this country using hydrocarbons, uh, realizing that we've gone from 30% dependency overseas to now 60%, and we're shutting off ANWR, we're shutting off uh, offshore drilling, uh, we have hydrofracking under attack, which would severely constrict our flow of natural gas. Um, what, in your opinion, is the future of hydrocarbons if we're allowed to exploit those, and how would it affect prices? 
Well, currently, uh, you know, coal, natural gas, and, and petroleum uh, provide the vast majority of, of U.S. energy supply, uh, over 80 percent. Um, you know, our projections over the next 25 years, which are, would as assume the continuance of uh, current laws and regulations, would see a, a modest decline in the fossil fuel share as other uh, sources of energy, uh, renewable energy in particular, uh, increase. But uh, at least in our outlook, for there to be a significant change from the current share of fossil fuels in the energy system, something would need to change in terms of uh, current policy or technological breakthroughs or other market trends that we're not currently foreseeing. Time of the gentleman is the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Holtz, recognized. Uh, thank you, and I thank the witnesses. Um, the um, uh, you know members of Congress uh, uh, always like to think that uh, we can turn short-term news stories into uh, uh, immediate political benefit. And uh, this is no less true with the short-term news about gas pri gasoline prices. Um, and um, I guess I would try to draw our attention to, um, to other longer-term implications of the news today. Uh, which is that uh, uprisings in the Middle East show how perilous our dependence on petroleum is, and the melting nuclear melting in Japan shows how perilous our dependence on nuclear power is. And they really underscore, I think, our failure to have a broad-based energy portfolio and our failure to have a rational look at our energy usage. Um, Mr. Russo, I, I think you said uh, that prices are, demand, uh, are determined by supply and demand globally. And in fact, several of you have said that sort of thing. Um, let me ask, uh, I guess, first, Mr. Um, uh, um, Mr. Newell, um, what is the scale, and let's put in perspective here, uh, of possible short-term uh, energy productions. I mean, suppose there were a lot more leases for offshore drilling released in the last couple of years. Suppose there were uh, uh, much more drilling on public lands, or even large increases in the uh, uh, drilling on private lands. What's the scale of the increase in um, uh, in production that we might achieve compared to what OPEC can do by turning the valves up and down uh, in the short term? Well, there's a, uh, a, a considerable lag between um, you know, increased access to resources and then exploration and development and then ultimate production of those resources. So there is an important issue with return to time scale, which I think you mentioned. Um, in the short run, uh, to uh, respond to immediate impacts in crude oil supply, uh, one really needs to look at the availability of, of spare production capacity in OPEC, which is where that uh, currently uh, lies. Um, in terms of um, non-OPEC countries tend to uh, produce available uh, capacity at, at full production. So certainly in the short term, uh, that's where the available spare capacity. Um, in, in the longer term, the, the areas uh, at least I'm, under... I'm actually talking about short term. You're talking uh, about short term. In other words, what I, 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 I just to make sure we're clear on this. Uh, OPEC can affect the price of a barrel of oil um, rather quickly uh, compared to anything we could do by production in the United States. Is, uh, is, is, am, am I stating that correctly? I, I would say that's correct. The, the, all of the spare production capacity that is available is in OPEC countries. The vast majority of that is in Saudi Arabia. Okay. Um, well, there are actually so many, so many things to cover, but let me, uh, let me just pursue this point a, a little bit longer. Um, Mr. Markey pointed out that over the longer term, um, this will be more and more true, will it not? Because if the U.S. is burning its oil reserves faster than any other nation, 
and it is largely OPEC countries that are burning through their reserves at a much, much slower rate than we are, that means they will have, a more, have more and more leverage uh, than, than we will uh, in future years. Uh, if we have 2% of the reserves, 11% of the re production now, and 25% of the consumption. Uh, am I describing that uh, accurately? Yes, uh, please, Mr. Newell. OPEC countries currently provide about 40% of global uh, oil liquid supply. Non-OPEC countries, about 60%. Uh, we, and I think most other analysts that I've seen, expect that the OPEC share will tend to increase over time because the vast majority of reserves of oil are located in OPEC countries. And because we are burning through our reserves uh, fast, uh, considerably faster than they are, so we will have a smaller and smaller share even if these, some of these larger, possibly economically recoverable uh, uh, by some stretch of the imagination are, are out there. Is that, uh, is that correct? Uh, just, you can, uh, short time the, answer. Yeah, time of the gentleman has, uh, has expired. And if you'd like to, if you would respond back in writing, I'm sure Mr. Holt would be uh, appreciative of that. Uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Southern is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I, wanted to, um, I wanted to ask, I know that, that all of you have probably read the report that was uh, delivered by the commission the president uh, put together regarding uh, the, uh, the disaster in the Gulf. Um, and I, I, I'm just curious because you, you seem to be very astute in understanding this issue as good as any panel that, that, that we've seen come before us. I'm just curious, I've asked uh, members of the administration this question, and, and I'm just curious your answer, does, in, in light of the President's statement um, uh, that, that he believes high oil prices are acceptable, uh, he, he made that statement August the uh, 20th of 2008, um, that it, it, it is a necessary occurrence to push us in a direction uh, to, to, to make us explore other energy sources. Um, and, and it seems that, that with uh, the Department of Interior's uh, issuing of, of 720 uh, violations uh, to BP, uh, and, and, and which, which is bothersome to me, uh, and, and not rescinding the Jones Act in light of that disaster to help contain uh, the oil that uh, was spilled into the Gulf. I'm just curious. Uh, and this is simple yes or no. I'm going to run down the line here. Uh, Mr. Resco, do you, d does the government bear any responsibility, any, uh, uh, for uh, the oil disaster in the Gulf? Uh, the commission said that uh, the department... I, I'm really not interested in the commission. They've already been here. I'm really interested in what you think. Uh, any. Yes, they, they, they That's a need yes? to prove their... I, need to, I got times of... Yes? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Yes. No, 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 you're on the panel. You've you, you got to have... Just you and me right here talking. Forget all these other, forget all these other people. It's just you and me. Give me your, give me your opinion. Ms. Pierce, you... Oh, I understand it's difficult, and that's why I ask it. Uh, but, uh, but it's really not that difficult. Uh, 720 violations cited... Uh, refusal to uh, I, no, and, and this is my time. That's right. So I'm asking the question: Yes or no? You don't know. So the 720 violations, the refusal to contain the accident as a result of, and, and, and rescind the Jones Act, and in light of uh, what we've seen, the, the underwriting of, 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 of oil exploration in countries like Brazil by this administration, you're telling me that the government bore no responsibility. And Mr. Salazar, you know, is an amazing man. He has 70,000 employees at his disposal, a $12 billion budget. He can focus like a laser beam, as he stated last week in testimony here. Uh, do they bear any response? I mean, 1%, 5%? Well, clearly the Department of Okay. And that's where that, dr that's where that oil drill, I mean, the, the, the well was. Thank you. Mr. Newell. Uh, Congressman, respectfully, I've not evaluated uh, the issue, and so I'm going to decline to answer. Really? 
You've read the report? Would, would the gentleman yield? To, would, yes, yeah. I would. It, it is very difficult sometimes when you call up uh, members of the uh, administration, albeit different agencies, to respond on on uh, those questions in deference to uh, my friend. And I, and I know very well uh, how focused he has been on that uh, answer. But I just wanted to make that uh, observation. Uh, let me ask, uh, with the remaining time, um, uh, 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 with the remaining time, uh, Mr. Newell, uh, do you believe that um, uh, with the decline of over 250,000 barrels per day, um, do you believe that this will cause job producing oil companies to remove their rigs from the Gulf and move those to other countries around the world? So, so I, th I think you're referring to in our short term energy outlook, uh, we're forecasting this year a decline of about 250,000 barrels per day relative to last year in the uh, offshore uh, Gulf of Mexico oil production, uh, which is uh, maybe roughly half of that one could attribute to the uh, the well blowout moratorium and subsequent uh, regulatory situation. The other half is due to, approximately a half, is due to natural decline because we had been on an upswing in offshore production. Uh, in terms of there, there are certainly uh, job losses associated with the decline in production there. Um, it, it, in terms of uh, rigs and their specific location, early on there actually had not been much movement of rigs. I, to be honest, I haven't recently tracked exactly where those rigs are and so I couldn't comment specifically on that. But the ones that are missing are not in the Gulf. So they're somewhere. They are somewhere. We know they're somewhere. They're not where we would really need them to be, though. We know that. Correct? I mean, there they're, they're, they're are rigs that are moving. It, it, it is true that at some point in time, uh, rigs will move on. Or, Early on, the last time that I looked closely at it, they hadn't because they were waiting in anticipation that uh, drilling would resume. And so at the point in time when I last looked at it, there had not been significant movement, but that was a while ago. And so I just can't comment on exactly what the situation is today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, the time of the gentleman has expired. General Lady from Hawaii, Mrs. Hanabuso. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let's begin with uh, Mr. Newell. Mr. Newell, in your statement on page two, uh, you said that this, what you're about to discuss in your report, uh, did not take into effect what happened in Japan. Uh, Japan would definitely have a, an impact on, the, uh, on what you were looking at as a short-term energy outlook. Can you tell me, uh, if you were to calculate that into your statement here, how it would have an impact? Sure. The, the uh, short-term uh, production and particularly price outlook that's reflected in the testimony is from our short-term energy outlook, which came out a couple weeks ago. And um, since then, we've seen significant uh, fluctuations in uh, oil and gasoline prices. Uh, in terms specifically of, uh, in terms of Japan, uh, yesterday, in terms of immediate response, we'd actually seen a decline uh, in oil prices, which um, I think most of us would associate it to a, a concern that there would actually be a decline in economic activity, uh, a, an immediate decline in uh, the requirements for, for fuel, but also just broader sense that there was a, a hit to Japan's economy and which has, you know, global implications. Um, as of yesterday, the price of oil was down significantly. Today, today it's back up again. And so in terms of how this all shakes out, there's really a number of competing things that are going on right now in, in global oil markets. There's the a principal one is the unrest in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, Japan was weighing on that yesterday, but today it seems like the resurgence is probably more associated with, again, turning to unrest in Middle East and North Africa. So the sense in which we'll have to uh, reflect the effect of Japan, I think that we'll see over the next uh, several weeks how that unfolds. Thank you. My next question is for Mr. Caruso. Mr. Caruso, you're um, in some reports that you've been quoted in, you're speaking about the release of the oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And I, for all of us, the main question is, how does that then translate to the consumer? What does the consumer, can the consumer expect some kind of relief if we were to go to the releasing of oil from the SBR? Could you comment on that? I, th I think it, uh obviously depends on the amount and the duration of the release. But we saw both during the Iraq invasion of Kuwait and the post-Katrina releases that were presidential drawdowns of the SPR, that it did have a, an impact on, uh, on lowering the price of oil from where it was before the release and after. So it really depends on specific circumstances. 
and a significant release for a long, relatively long duration, which in my view would be 30 days or more, uh, could have a, an impact on the, on the price, depending on uh, if whether or not OPEC countries might respond by reducing their production. So, so it's a lot more the, uh, contingent on the global what happens elsewhere. But in the specific answer is it could have a uh, an, an important effect depending on the uh, volume and duration. Is there anything else that could have an Im an impact like that in the short term? Is that the, is that our best our best tool to reduce the price for the consumer right now that you can think of? I think that particularly if it's done in cooperation, coordination with our international energy agency partners uh, is the, the most important short-term crisis management tool we have in our uh, arsenal. Thank you. My next question is for Director Rusko. It seems to me that you're talking about two different things in your report. One is the revenue or the, or the interior's uh, failure, I guess, for lack of better description, for really monitoring the revenue source. And the second is the permits and what's going on. Can you tell me if, in fact, the permitting system or the leasing system by Interior has really resulted with the loss of the revenue? Well, that's very complicated, but um, we do think that, that the, um, the efficiency of the management of permitting leaves a lot to be desired and could be done in a, in a more efficient way if Interior could um, do better um, uh, workforce planning and better management of its human capital assets so that it had the right number of people to respond to changes in either um, uh, applications to drill or nominations for lands to be leased but also to respond to public protests of those, of those leases. And it has not responded to those kinds of changes uh, very effectively in the past. So there have been delays. The delays on, on leases associated with protests have been matters of uh, months, though not, not years or anything like that. Thank Time you. of the gentlelady has expired. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Timpton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the panel taking the time to be able to be here today. And uh, I'd like to start with Mr. Newell first. Um, I come out of the District of Colorado, to where we have a tremendous amount of uh, energy reserves uh, that are accessible, really, for our nation. Uh, do you know how many oil and gas leases are currently backlogged in the state of Colorado? Uh, I, I do not. That would be in the Department of Interior, I believe. Okay, that would fall under that. Uh, in terms of some of the backlogs in, uh, Mr. Rusco, uh, when you're talking about being able to create some efficiencies in the permitting process, uh, do you have some good ideas that uh, we can pass on to the Secretary of Interior? Well, we've recommended that, that um, uh, Interior look at trying to rationalize the, the implementation of laws and regs across its many field offices in, in the Bureau of Land Management. So what we see is an inconsistency in the application of laws and regulations. We feel that coordinating and, and providing better guidance across all the field offices would make it easier and more efficient, um, both from the perspective of, of companies applying, but also in terms of protecting the environment, protecting safety, and also uh, collecting the right amount of revenues. Great. Uh, Ms. Pierce, uh, could you give us an idea if uh, we're looking at how many, when we're looking at oil shale, how many potential barrels of oil uh, are captured in oil shale? Oh, there's a tremendous amount of potential. Can you give us oil. an idea? How many barrels? The, well, we just recently did a, a reevaluation of that, and I don't have the numbers at my fingertip, but there are billions of potential billions. of in place resources. We did not do a technically recoverable resource estimate because there isn't one technology yet that is proven, but there is a lot of potential oil. So with investment in technologies to be able to liberate this energy, America can have a bright future in terms of energy development in this country. Possibly. There's Is a that lot possibly of work to be done, a case? But possibly. Great. Uh, 
You know, uh, Mr. Caruso, you'd made the comment uh, that uh, we'd reached our peak, I believe it was, in 1972, around 1972, concerning domestic reserves. And uh, I just happened to read some body language, and I saw Ms. Foss uh, shake her head. Would you care to comment on that, Ms. Foss? I have no idea what the peak might be, and I don't think that anyone does, and I really think that people can't claim to know that. Um, the Earth is a huge place geologically. We have abundant resources that we haven't even begun to really explore or, or learn how to utilize. Um, so I think what we, what we are faced with are periodic constraints and timing. How do you mobilize investment and direct that into new plays and, and new prospective areas, new technologies? And every time we do that, we replenish our production. And I wanted to put that word on the table from the previous discussion, replenishment. That's what we do in this country. So it's unfair to look at burn rates and things like that without understanding that what we are very, very, very good at is moving from that resource category to a reserve category to production in a very efficient way. And it's, and it's a powerful process that has to be better understood and, and shepherded the right way and managed the right way by industry and government. Now, I don't see any reason to, to think about peaks or um, you know, other constraints. I think the constraints have more to do with how we feel about our, our resources that are available and the, the, the various options that we have for developing them. Good. Uh, Ms. Pierce, uh, we've had, had a lot of comment and can't ever take the politics out of anything, uh, but uh, in regards to uh, uh, U.S. energy production under the Obama administration, but uh, can you give me an idea in regards to our, our onshore leases that are produ began producing after 2008, how many of these were due to leases that were approved by the previous administration? Uh, I really can't answer that because that's not U.S. Geological Survey, Great. but yeah. we'd be happy to work with Bureau of Land Management to get you that answer. Great. Um, just by way of comment, uh, you know, we, have, we hear that we have 2% uh, of the world's oil reserves in this country and that we consume. We've got that burn rate of around 25%. Uh, there are some who believe, and I happen to be one, uh, that we benefit the world. Uh, we happen to be one of the highest uh, productive people in the world that reach out when we're talking about Japan, U.S. naval ships, the resources that we are able to bring to bear to be able to help people when they are in need, the technology which unfortunately never comes in, our intellectual capital, into our trade uh, calculations in terms of our exports as well. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for this country uh, to be able to develop our resources right here at home to switch in terms of how we're using some of those resources, the T-Boom Pickens plan when it comes to uh, being able to drive our vehicles as well. Uh, that those opportunities are certainly going to be there. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your time. Time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, gentleman, or Chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, just uh, one point uh, in response to a statement made by my friend, Mr. Sutherland. Um, a point of clarification, there are actually more rigs in the Gulf of Mexico now than there were before the BP spill. There are now 125 rigs in the Gulf uh, compared to 122 one year ago. Just wanted to put it on the record. But I have a question of, of Mr. Newell. Uh, speculation is often pointed to as a cause of rising or unstable oil prices. Uh, to help prevent harmful speculation, last year's Wall Street reform legislation included uh, provisions to regulate these kinds of trades through the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the CFTC. However, the spending bill HR1 would cut funding for CFTC by $56.8 million, almost a third of the agency's entire budget. This is despite the chairman of CFTC recently testifying before the Senate Agricultural Committee that the CFTC already does not have enough funding to properly enforce these provisions under the Wall Street Reform Bill. Can you speak to the role of speculation in the price of oil and the difficulties of addressing this problem when HR 1 would reduce the budget of the agency in charge of cracking down on speculation by almost a third? 
What I'm really asking you is your position on the role of speculation and whether we should be cutting the money uh, used to, to uh, scrutinize and enforce that speculation. Well, to the to your to your first part of your question, um, you know, speculation clearly has a role in in oil and other commodity markets. I mean, there are uh, because commodities, in particular, you know, oil, but others as well, are storable. There's always going to be a anticipation or expectations about what the price of that might be in the future, and therefore there will be actors in the market uh, making, uh, you know, basically voicing their opinions through the marketplace about how they think those prices will change over time. Um, in terms of the role of uh, uh, different regulatory agencies, uh, the agency I head is not a regulatory agency, but the, the role of regulatory agencies like the Commodity Futures Trading Commission is to you know, oversee transpar transparent and efficient markets. The, uh, the proposals that they are developing relate to uh, position limits in uh, energy commodity markets. I mean, the intent of those is to uh, you know, prevent uh, excess concentration of any particular actor in those markets. And therefore, uh, from a market efficiency point of view, uh, the, the, the role of that is to prevent any undue influence on, on market prices. But I would uh, defer in terms of uh, expressing a further opinion on the, on, the, on the role of that regulation. Well, Congress last year, at least in its wisdom or lack thereof, felt that speculation did play a role and therefore passed legislation which is the law of this nation, uh, to try to scrutinize and regulate uh, that uh, speculation. And uh, I guess we want to know whether uh, we should be, if that legislation made sense in the first place, should we be cutting the budget of the agency that is to look at that speculation? It's not a huge budget uh, in itself, 56.8 million, yet they want to cut that by one third. Do you think that is a prudent thing to do? I, I, I think I'll decline. Uh, the budgetary decisions, I, th I think, are pretty uh, loaded with, with policy implication, and so I'm going to decline to express a policy opinion on that. Well, I would invite anyone else. Anyone want to comment on that? I don't see anyone jumping in, but... Uh... All right, I'll try to find the answer from someone else. Thank you very much. The gentleman yield back. I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for uh, calling this, um, this hearing. Very timely. Gas hitting $3, average $3.54 a gallon today. Um, you know, I come from a district that uh, we've been uh, uh, I guess we started this whole situation with the drilling of oil at Drake Oil Well within walking distance of my district office in Titusville. And I, I take exception with uh, uh, one of the comments made by one of my colleagues earlier about big oil. I, I have to tell you, my, there are families, been uh, independent drillers, small businesses, they're, they're, they've been drilling oil for generations for 151 years. So this is not a big oil, it's not an issue with me. This is about small businesses and jobs and energy security. Uh, and just one quick note, I thought it was interesting, the chart that was shown in terms of burning through the reserves, that the, the country with the next, uh, the closest uh, burn rate to what was portrayed in the United States was Norway. In the United States, over 303 million Americans uh, population, Norway, four million. So it, uh, size uh, probably does have a bearing on how much we use, but um, uh, my, my question, those are all about current. I, uh, one quick question um, that should, uh, it should be very easy, and I'll just open this to the panel. Uh, is there any renewable fuel which will take the place of oil in the next decade, we'll say? Uh, does we go yes or no based on your professional experience? Let's just go right down the, the row if we could. So in terms of uh, the, the main uh, fuel that uh, would replace oil over our projections, which go out to the 2035, is um, uh, biofuels, uh, pr principally in the form so far of, of, of so, corn-based so ethanol. 2035, I'll take that as a no, since I said a decade. So if we, I got a number of questions. If we yeah. just get a response. No, we don't, we don't see petroleum being replaced Next in a de decade. Thank you. No? No. 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 Not this century. Not this century. There you go. <laughs> Raise the stakes. I defer to the EIA on that. <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. I appreciate it. Um, 
wanted to, uh, uh, Mr. Rusko, this is a real basic question, but I, I think it's important for people to understand. Will you tell us who owns the oil and natural gas on and offshore, which are on federal lands? Who owns the, the gas on federal lands? The, on and off federal lands. The, the public owns. The public, absolutely, United States taxpayers. Uh, Mr. Nolan, on, uh, you state on page six that our recoverable crude oil resources are estimated to be 219 barrels. Um, certainly, based on that, I'm sure you agree that, uh, um, that that's owned by the American taxpayers. Uh, or I guess not all of it is on federal lands. How much would you be es estimate to be owned by uh, the American taxpayers? I, I, I don't have with me an e exact figure for that. The 219 billion of technically recoverable resources refers to all of it. So some of that would be under private lands. Um, offshore, in the, in the uh, federal offshore, lower 48 is about 64 billion barrels, which is uh, federally owned in effect by the public. But th that's, there's more than that. Yeah. And based on previous testimony I heard, I actually have confidence for the stuff that's the oil, the resources are privately owned. It's the issue we've run up against is the ones that the taxpayers own that we haven't done a, a, um, um, a, a good job of production. Um, of that 219, um, let me move on to uh, some of the math. I tried to do some basic math, not a real strong suit of mine, um, but I calculated that approximately uh, 814,000 square miles of the lower 48 offshore miles have been placed off limits by the president. No lease bids offered. We're not talking about the Gulf of Mexico, okay, where the, the most two recent leases were leased. It was, it was the remaining part. So um, 814,000 square miles off lease. That's nearly uh, 521 million acres or five times the size of California. Uh, Mr. Noll or, or Ms. Pierce, can you tell us how much oil and natural gas are contained in those 521 million acres? And as a part of your answer, would you tell us when the last modern seismograph inventory was taken of our offshore oil and gas? I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Brenda on the, the second part. Um, in terms of the, 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 the major part, in terms of uh, areas that are currently under uh, congressional moratoria actually would be the central and eastern Gulf of Mexico, which I believe is six point something uh, billion barrels. Uh, that's the most promising area in terms of the Gulf of Mexico and also in terms of what's available on the both Pacific and Atlantic coast really is in uh, the Gulf of Mexico where the vast majority of that production is already occurring. So it would be the, the central part and then the eastern part, which is under congressional moratoria to 2022. Um, in terms of the seismic, I would have to look up some of the numbers. Some is quite recent, some is quite dated, several decades old. old. Depends upon where you are in the Outer Continental Shelf. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Oregon, Mr. DeFazio. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Newell, on uh, page 7 uh, in the uh, middle of your testimony, you say, given the increasing importance of OPEC supply and the global oil supply demand balance, another key issue is how OPEC production would respond to any increase in non-OPEC supply, i.e., our production, potentially offsetting any direct price effect. I mean, we hear this all the time. It's a world market. Um, and I, for years, starting with the Bush administration, uh, now with the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, now the Obama administration, I have asked that we file a complaint against OPEC for illegal uh, commodity manipulation uh, under the WTO. Uh, I'm told, well, they, you know, they, it, it's not covered. Well, the, the only exemption is for conservation purposes, and OPEC never pretends to be conserving their oil. They, they're setting the market by ramping their production up and down. They've ramped up because of Libya, you know, they'll ramp down. They, they have a price target. Um, so if we produced uh, some additional oil, is that likely to change unless we uh, sue OPEC and go through a WTO process and break the cartel? I mean, they could easily offset additional production here by dropping their production there. I, I, I think that's correct. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, then secondly, um, and I would engage anybody on the panel who wants to join me in, in pushing this issue. I have legislation on it. I've written, uh, like I say, bipartisan problem. Bush administration, Clinton administration, now the Obama administration. The special trade representative will not take on OPEC. I guess we're scared of them for some reason. Um, secondly, uh, 
um, Mr. Newell, the, the, uh, the Enron loophole or commodity speculation. I mean, you spoke as though uh, we had set a very stringent new limits uh, on, uh, on the markets uh, for uh, players in the market. As I understand the financial services reform, it exempted uh, people who are not end users uh, from this, particularly hedge funds and others, and even the other regulations for uh, pension funds and folks like that have, haven't been promulgated yet. So we don't have very significant uh, restrictions yet on, uh, on people's uh, accumulating large numbers of contracts, do we? I, I don't have an opinion on the relative stringency of the CFTC regulations, whether that's they're too much or too little. I just right. don't have an opinion. But you, Okay, but the point is, you're saying there is little or no effect by speculators. There are other experts out saying there is a dramatic effect uh, by speculators on the market because right now there is not an oil shortage, but we've seen prices run up very dramatically. So if there's not a shortage, and we were just talking about supply and demand among end users, why would the price run up so much if there's a balance between supply and demand? I think there's only one other you know, it's got to be problems with speculators, right? I, I think there's been a number of factors that over the last several months have driven oil prices higher. Uh, there's been a rebound in the global economy. I, I know that is sometimes, you know, hard to appreciate here because the U.S. has still got a high unemployment rate, but there's been significant rebound in global economic growth. This has led to a, a significant resurgence in global oil demand. Um, so this had brought prices back up into the $75 to $85 per barrel range. Then in the last quarter of last year, there was increased uh, unusually high demand for winter fuel, heating fuel, which led to a further increase in prices. And then on top of that, we've had the recent unrest in the Middle East and North Africa, which has unsettled the market, uh, has, has taken about a, at least a million barrels per day off the market, and then has also unsettled the market due to the centrality. But of I the thought Middle the East Saudis had agreed to increase production to offset that. And, and they have, and um, they, they, they have. So, so I guess the question is, where's all that money going? And that's, I mean, I, I know where some of it's going. Exxon's profits last quarter of last year was the largest quarterly profit for any earthly entity in the history of the world. $9.25 billion, up 53% in one year. Is that supply and demand? 53%? someone who's got a substantial stranglehold on the market, and they made a 53% one-year increase in a quarterly profit. I mean, that's just supply and demand. No speculation involved, no manipulation involved, nothing. U.S. consumers should just say, oh, that's the way it is. Is there anything we can do about this? I mean, you can, we can sit here and pretend that if we uh, let out some more leases, somehow this is going to help. We already discussed that because OPEC will just drop them. You know, they want to keep a price target, they can keep it. We won't take them on in the WTO. All right, so that's a problem. We got ExxonMobil with, you know, operating uh, with such market clout that they can drive the market too. Uh, and uh, gouge our consumers and increase their profits 53% in one year? That's extraordinary. I mean, do you have any suggestions on how we can deal with some of this? I mean, we've got long-term issues about supply, but we've got short-term issues about people being screwed at the pump right now by big oil and OPEC, and we're not doing anything about it. Time's expired. Gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Brown's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe very firmly if a nation cannot feed itself, cannot clothe itself, and is not energy independent, it's not a secure nation. And we're not a secure nation because we're not energy independent. The Department of Energy was founded during the Carter administration, as we all know, to make us energy independent. It's been a dismal failure in that charge. According to the AAA, the average price nationwide for regular gasoline is about $3.55 a gallon. This is the highest price ever in the month of March, and is over 40 cents higher than just a month ago. These skyrocketing gas prices and a risky dependence on fuel supplied by volatile foreign nations such as Libya highlight our need for an American energy policy that emphasizes production and decreases our reliance upon foreign oil. The United States is the only nation on earth that forbids development of its own God-given natural resources. We've been blessed by our Creator with abundant natural resources, and we should not be hesitant to tap into them, especially at a time when energy costs are so high. However, since taking office, 
The Obama administration has done everything in its power to lock up our energy resources even more with de facto moratoriums. Production in the Gulf of Mexico alone has declined by 300 barrels, 300,000 barrels of oil per day just due to the Obama administration's actions. Energy is the lifeblood of the American economy. Our nation's economic prosperity is closely tied to the availability of reliable and affordable sources of energy. Unfortunately, U.S. energy production has grown by only about 13 percent, while energy consumption has grown by 30 percent since 1973. At a time when 9 percent of our citizens are unemployed, and in my district we have some counties that have 17 percent unemployment, food prices are going high, with a still struggling economy, we must do everything in our power to allow for responsible use of our known American supplies of energy. Now, Dr. Foss, it's been proposed by the Obama administration of tapping, a possibility of tapping into our strategic petroleum reserves. Does this make sense at all, or should we develop the known resources we have here in the United States? I think the psychology in the marketplace would be much more significantly impacted by decisions that affect us longer term rather than now. I don't think that, this is my own opinion, I don't think that an SPR release right now would matter much because I don't think we have an inventory problem, we have a fear problem, we have a concern about the future, we have expectations about the future, uncertainty about how events will unfold in a critical producing region, and uncertainty about policies here and, and investment actions here. And I think that symbolic steps, meaningful steps that, that indicate that we're willing to, to um, make sure that we have a robust industry here would have a lot more, much more impact on traders and trader psychology and market psychology than using the SPR. Thank you, Dr. Foss. I, I think tapping into strategic reserves is, is not sound policy, and I think it's inane to even consider doing so. Um, there are other things that we can do. I think the first time a drill hits the ground and starts drilling in Anwar, you'll see oil prices come down worldwide. But what can we do, Dr. Foss, to here in the U.S. to lower gasoline prices? Well, I think some good points came up in the in the panel today, um, both on the supply side, ensuring that this the moving portfolio of resource to reserve to production conversion is able to continue to function the right way. So that means looking at how the industry operates, ensuring that um, appropriate regulatory and policy oversight is there, but that it's done the right way. It's streamlined, it's transparent, everybody can understand it. Um, the public, industry, and, and the government agencies that are involved. Um, the industry has to be able to maintain portfolios of drillable prospects. And I think people have to understand what that entails in terms of both public and private mineral leasing, access to resources, and then the investment cycles that, that are needed. Um, and then on the demand side, I think some key points were made. Um, considering how valuable hydrocarbons are because of their energy content, we should use them wisely. And, and I think by now we have reams of research that show how much we can gain by a affecting things like combustion engine performance and vehicle technology um, that allow us to get basically more bang for the bunk the buck for every gallon of gasoline that we use. And I think that's what we ought to focus on. Thank Thanks, you. Dr. Foss, my time's expired. Thank you very much. Uh, now recognize the gentleman from Louisiana. You, you don't have a, a witness here that speaks the same language like you did yesterday, but you're still recognized for five minutes. That's right. I'm, I'm going to try real hard. I got a lot, a lot to ask. I don't know if I'll get over that. I never have enough time over here. <laughs> I, I, I want to just make one quick comment that I'm certainly glad that um, mankind did not calculate the perils uh, uh, or the perilous circumstances of sea voyage about 400 years ago so that they could find this great country. I guess that's why my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are so mad. They didn't, do that, they didn't do that calculation. I guess if they would, they wouldn't have come over here and then they could have been born in Europe. Um, but but 
I mean, you know, it, just common sense over here. I, um, I, I wanted to ask, and, and I don't know if they, they asked you this, Mr. Noah, I had to step out a couple of different times, but uh, last week the president had a press conference. Uh, he uh, made some statements. And uh, did, did, did the White House call you and, and ask you to give him any statistics on that? I'm, I'm sorry, what specific uh, statement well, are you referring well, to? Well, he, he, he had a, a press conference where he talked about production increases um, and, and how he was doing such a fabulous job of increasing oil production in this country. I was just wondering, did, 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 were you in that meeting, a brief, did they brief you and, and call you and ask you to send them some statistics? So, if, if no, 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 that's a yes or no. I mean, did they call you last week to, to give, ask you to send them some data? Uh, there, there is data in that fact sheet that comes from EIA, yes. That, 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 that was spent, sent specifically to the White House on a request I, last week? You know, I, I was not involved well, in providing them data. There's, it's very routine for EIA well, to be providing well, do, data. Do you, know, do you know if you sent them this data that says in the first quarter of 2011, your agency said that production per day in the Gulf will decrease uh, from 1.59 million barrels to 1.4 million barrels a day? Are you, you asking me if they're, they're, the numbers in our short-term energy outlook? Are no, 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 no. Did, I know that's your numbers. Okay. Did you send that to the president? Uh, did you send that to the administration? Because he, he seemed, he didn't, uh, he never mentioned that in his press conference. He, he, he just said that production it was the highest. He's just, he's a fellow who gave us all all. Did, did, he send, did you send that to the White House? I'm trying to figure out if he got these, did you or did you not send these statistics to the White House, if they asked you last week for some statistics, was this statistic in there? My recollection of what's in the fact sheet was, was kind of history, historical as opposed to our forecast. And uh -huh. so... I mean, don't you think that, that I mean, you, you, you don't just send him facts, but you evidently uh, try to uh, influence policy by doing forecasts, or you would not have run these numbers. I mean, don't you think it was your responsibility to send it to the president and say, boss, I think you're fixing to make a big misstatement? Uh, we, we, cert we certainly do not do our forecasts to influence policy. Quite to the contrary, we do, our, we do our forecasts in order to inform people about the current state of affairs and the likely state of affairs in the future, given what, what we see in the market and regulatory outlook. Well, okay, that didn't answer the question, but... but um, do you or don't you agree that under the current policy, production in the Gulf of Mexico will continue to decline? Uh, yeah, there is a lot. No, 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 no. That's yes, no. I mean, it's pretty simple. They don't need an explanation. Oh. It's just, is the number going down or is it going up? Over the next two years, with our, which is where our short-term outlook goes, there is a decline in the Gulf of Mexico in terms of offshore oil production. Okay, and so the Gulf of Mexico production Increase, it factors into the entire domestic production, correct? That's correct. So that means that if that goes down, then domestic production goes down. Is that correct? Other things equal, that'll tend to lower the rate of change of domestic production, yes. Well, I mean, okay. other, th other things equal, uh, like, like what? Well, there, there, there could be, off so there's, there's also offsetting effects because there's... On Such floor. as? Well, there's been increased production of liquids-rich natural gas shell plays. There's been increased production on the Bakken on, in the lower... Really? Places. Well, I'm glad you brought that point up because, you see, he's taking credit for increase of production, but yet there's one project in the Gulf, one project, one deep water project, started, leased under Reagan, another lease block was under Bush or, uh, or Clinton, and then um, I think it, the, the, the started drilling uh, in... Bush 2 in 99, the platform was set in 2005, 250,000 barrels a day. 250,000. You think there's anything onshore, uh, one well that can produce that much oil onshore? Uh, it, it, no, 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 that's yes and no. I mean, that's pretty easy. I mean, you know the facts. You know where all log is in the, in the country. Is Do you think that, that, that there is a project where onshore where we can get 250,000 barrels a day out of a, out of a well? No. Thank you. No. I yield. Uh, Mr. Johnson of Ohio is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank the panel for being here with us today. Uh, uh, not too long ago, we had an opportunity uh, to question uh, Secretary Salazar uh, in, a, in a hearing here. Uh, it, it became very clear through several of the questions 
um, and, and the Secretary made a, a comment that uh, oil prices are determined on an international market, and therefore America has no influence, little to no influence on the price of oil, thereby little control over the price of gas at the pumps. Do you agree with Secretary Salazar, Dr. Ross, I'm sorry, Dr. Foss, when he said that the U.S. cannot impact the price of oil and therefore the, uh, the price of gas at the pumps? I, I disagree. And would you explain why you disagree? We're both a large producer, the largest producer, and a large consumer, and I still think we're the largest consumer. We haven't been passed up yet. Um, that gives us, I think, market clout that we don't use fully to our advantage, and I think there are a lot of ways of exercising that um, that came up this morning, I think, um, through international relationships, through our own actions um, in our own country, um, through our industry's activities, um, how, we, how we signal to the world our intentions going forward, um, all of those things, how we manage our energy consumption, things that we do to, to put in place to use our energy resources wisely. Like all of that has impact. Well, it, it encourages me that you think so, because I certainly think so as well. And as I commented to, uh, to Secretary Salazar, it, it greatly concerns me uh, that, uh, that our leaders in the administration and in the cabinet seem to uh, have feel that their hands are tied behind their back, and that is just further indication to me, as I mentioned then, that we have a failed energy policy uh, here in America, and that should be alarming uh, to the American taxpayers. It's certainly alarming to me. Uh, another question. Uh, he brought forth a budget, and one of his justifications for his increase in budget was so that they could put in a robust permitting uh, approval process in place. Uh, now, I don't have these numbers exactly right, but you'll get the intent of my meaning. Um, uh, three years ago, two years ago, 300 and some permits approved. Uh, a year ago, 100 and some permits approved. This year, 30 some permits approved. Uh, and, and we're on a steady downhill curve. Why do you think it is that the Department of the Interior needs more money in 2012 to go back to producing and, and uh, authorizing permits at a level that for which they were doing it for less money three years ago. Is that, does my question make sense? We were, we, were, we were authorizing 300 plus permits just a couple of years ago. We're down to the 30s. In the deep water area, we're down to almost none, one or two. But yet they want more money to put a robust permitting process in place. They were doing it for a lot less three years ago. Why, why do you think they need the additional money and an increase in budget, Dr. Foss, to, um, to put a permitting process in place that's... Help me out. Sure. Thanks for clarifying that you were directing the question to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Um, I think that uh, there's a certain amount of public funding that probably needs to be used. I'm not a budget expert. There are other people who are federal budget experts, and I'm not, um, to, to ensure that the permitting process um, happens the way it should. But around the commission report and around other discussions, there are also additional avenues of making sure that federal areas are managed and administered in a way that doesn't put as much pressure on the federal budget um, as perhaps some might think. Um, and that includes a range of things, how the agencies function themselves, yeah. getting industry to participate the right way. There are lots of options. Okay. I, I just want, I want to wrap up with one final question, uh, sort of a yes or no one as well. Do, do you agree that we have a flawed permitting process? I think we have implementation problems. So if that would... Are we, producing the, process, are we producing the number of permits that we should be producing to tap into America's resources? I think we need to think about how to implement a permitting That's process. That's a yes or no question. Yes. 
Okay. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Denham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I actually had a number of questions on permitting today, um, which I will submit and look for an answer in writing because I think the, the most pressing issue right now uh, actually has to do with burn rate. I'm surprised to see Mr. Markey's uh, um, graph there, and I would agree that burn rate, you know, we don't want to put ourselves uh, where we are in jeopardy because we're burning through all of our natural resources. But I think his chart suggests that Norway, you know, if you believe that Norway and Mexico are larger than, than the United States, that would actually actually be a factor. Or if we only had 2% of the world's oil reserves. So that's actually what I wanted to uh, ask some number of questions on. And first of all, Mr. Whitney, uh, you know, specifically, let me start with the, the president's statement last week was, even if we tap every single resource available to us, we can't escape the fact, fact, according to the president, we only control 2% of the world's oil, but we consume over a quarter of the world's oil. Now, some people are talking about control versus actually what our actual reserves are. So I wanted to just clarify, um, the CRS did come out with a report, and uh, the 2% figure is 19 billion barrels of oil, correct? Uh, that number's been updated from to about 21 or 22 billion mm -hmm. barrels, I think. And the number I show here from uh, the CRS's report is actually 140, 145.5 billion barrels? Uh, again, that number has been updated. I don't know what the latest uh, number is, but it's near that, yes. Okay. Well, I mean, that's a big difference. If you're saying 2% is less than 20 billion, but we actually believe that there's over 145 billion, that's... Well, this is the... Obviously would affect our burn rate. This is the difference in terminology between reserves and undiscovered resources. Uh, the president was referring to reserves only, which would be 21 billion barrels of U.S. reserves compared to total world reserves, and I don't have that number in front of me. Okay, and how about total recoverable energy reserves? Uh, the CRS report combining, that's obviously oil, natural gas, coal, 1.3 trillion? Yes, and the overwhelming majority of that number is coal, if you'll notice. Um, which, uh, if the discussion today is about gasoline prices, that um, volume of coal has very little to do with this discussion. But uh, Very little, but if you understand all of our energy reserves, we can obviously balance those different reserves uh, and make sure that we're self-sufficient. I mean, that's the biggest issue. If you're talking about burn rate, we want to be self-sufficient, not in danger of world markets. Right. And there are other issues we could address. For example, the, the uh, consumption of oil is tied to our transportation system. So if the transportation system in the future is converted to an electric uh, system or, or more reliant on electricity, then natural gas, coal, and nuclear are fuels for generating electricity, and that could help move us away from consumption of oil. Thank you. And, and uh, Mr. Markey's chart showed how we compare to the, the rest of the world. 1.3 trillion, how does that compare us to the rest of the world? Well, I'm gonna, it's the largest number in the world, but, I'm, world. but I wanna caveat that very carefully because um, I, as I put in the report, there are some caveats and disclaimers. Uh, within the US, we have very good numbers for proved reserves and for technically recoverable resources, thanks to USGS and EIA. Uh, once you get outside the United States, that data is much, much well, harder to... How do, we, how do we define recoverable? Uh, recoverable is... Considered recoverable? Is, pardon me? Tranquilian Ridge in California, is that considered recoverable? Uh, I'm not familiar with that field. Mr. Newell, Tranquilian Ridge, I'm sure you're... I mean, it's the biggest project in California, one of our largest states. Yeah, assuming that existing technology can get, get that resources at some price, then yes, that would be in technically recoverable. Are, are we assuming we don't have the technology? I mean, that's a different no, I, debate. I, I would hope that we're assuming we have the technology since yes. most other countries no, I was, have the technology. I, I was agreeing that so okay. technic, technically recoverable resources, as long as you have the technology, would be in that. So yes, that would be included. So that would be included in the 19.1 billion barrels? That the 2% that the president's referring to? Um, I'm not sure if that's because that's proven reserves and so I, I don't know specifically whether those have been proven reserved booked by a company which has an additional set of requirements for it to be considered proven reserves. I, I just don't know. 
Well, what I'm trying to get down to, and, and again, I've got a number of permitting questions, but what I'm trying to understand is when you say, when Mr. Markey shows a, a chart that says 2% and throws off these burn rate numbers and the president talks about 2%, are we talking about oil that we know of, oil that we is permitted and we're pulling out of the ground, or somewhere there in between? The reserve number, the 2% number is specifically res referring to a reserve number, right, which is proven reserves. Um, technically recoverable resources is a much bigger yep. number. The t time right. of the gentleman has expired. Well, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Gentleman from uh, South Carolina, Mr. Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, you know, American Energy Independence, that's what we're talking about. In 2007-2008, uh, I served under the uh, previous administration, uh, Department of Interior, MMS, five-year planning, OCS five-year planning subcommittee, which dealt with oil and natural gas leases on the Outer Continental Shelf and talked about the next five-year plan and where those leases would be. And I was amazed during that process that uh, how convoluted it really was because we were very limited on what we could talk about. We were limited to a certain grid section in the western GOM and one small spot off the coast of Alaska, and they were both in ultra deep water. In 2005, I went out, uh, probably 2006, I went out to Louisiana. And it was post Katrina, and we flew out to a deep water production platform and a deep water drilling platform. The platform I went to was the Devil's Tower. It was a spar platform floating in 5,600 feet of water. We also went to a drilling platform, which was a pontoon drilling platform for natural gas about four miles away, and so I've seen it for myself. And uh, Congressman Landry has been very clear about the impact of the de facto moratorium uh, on the Gulf Coast states. The fact that it's not just the energy companies, uh, the petroleum companies that are drilling. It's a trickle-down effect all the way to the smallest welder. It's a trickle-down effect, uh, effect to the states that are hit by this recession that are losing the, the royalty revenues. That's a double whammy to an already impacted economy that was impacted not only by the spill, which was unfortunate. But my understanding from talking with folks is that the companies that do exploration and drilling have met every requirement of this administration um, that, that was put out there in order to get back to work, in order for the permits to be issued. But yet, to this day, we only see that two permits have been issued. The American people want to see us deal with American energy independence. They understand it's a national security issue. You know, let me be clear. I'm for all, all resources that we have in this country to meet our energy needs. I'm very pro-nuclear energy. I'm pro on uh, drilling, uh, OCS, and here on the mainland. We've had, uh, thanks to the direction of our chairman, we've had the, the head of BLM in, in the committee, and we've talked about the Wildlands Act and, and the fact that uh, Secretary Salazar signed a secretarial order in December uh, to basically accelerate um, the designation of wilderness areas basically usurping the power of this Congress, which has the only statutory authority to designate wilderness areas, usurping that authority. So now we're seeing that federal lands are being taken off the table for energy exploration and energy production to meet our energy needs in this country. I think that's uh, abysmal. This administration spoke just recently about, and I applaud them for this, about the uh, necessity of increasing domestic production. But Actions speak louder than words. So I ask this administration to accelerate the permitting process. Let's get the people back in the Gulf of Mexico that, that have leases. Let's extend the current leases that are expiring because those folks stepped up the plate and they bought the rights to explore for energy sources and produce energy sources on those leases. Having been on that five-year planning subcommittee, I know the process that it takes to uh, recommend to the OCS committee the next five-year plan of where those leases should be. It's a long process. And if we started today, we're five, six, seven years out for the next uh, lease sale. And so we've got leases expiring and we don't have another lease sale. In fact, I don't know when that's going to happen. 
Anwar should be back on the table, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is the size of the great state that I come from, and that's South Carolina. But if we talk about the impacted area in Anwar, we're talking about a size uh, about the size of the Columbia Airport in Columbia, South Carolina, or maybe the size of the city of Charleston. If I stuck a postage stamp on that wall, uh, that's what we're talking about. Folks, it's time for us to be serious about energy production, meeting the uh, needs of this country with American resources for American energy production. That's deep water, that's onshore, that's offshore. Um, fracking, hydraulic fracturing. Um, James Lankford from Oklahoma mentioned yesterday that they've been fracking in Oklahoma for 50 years with not an instance. He said, come drink our water. Come drink our water. We're proud of it. We've got the ability to do that, Mr. Chairman. Um, let's not remove this federal land from uh, access for exploration. See what's out there, and then we can produce it. You know, Georgetown, I saw a sign, $4.69 a gallon. I think that's probably the highest in the nation, but still it's alarming. 469. 385 is alarming. I know what 485 a gallon diesel fuel meant to my small business in 2008. And I know what the rising cost of fuel means to large and small businesses in this country. And it's time for us to be serious for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time of the, time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, gentleman from Florida, Mr. Rivera. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to give you an indication, of perhaps, of what's going on with some of the residents in, in my state in the state of Florida where on average the price of a gallon of gasoline in Florida is currently about $3.56, which is uh, higher than the, than the national average. Just a month ago, just one month ago, the average in Florida was $3.13. And at this time, just one year ago in my state, the average was $2.00 and 82 cents. So this is a 74 cent or 26 percent increase over the past year in my state's fuel costs. Initially I thought to ask the panel whether they were aware if in certain states like Florida what the average household income was and whether that household income in states like Florida was keeping pace with the rise in fuel prices and that of course was going to be a, a rhetorical question. I, I presume while you may not know the exact amounts, you, you would probably all know that the answer is absolutely not, that household incomes have not kept pace. So the fact of the matter is, according to the latest American Community Survey put out by the U.S. Census Bureau, the average median income in my state, in Florida, has been declining. People's incomes are going down. So Florida's families and across the nation they're having a harder and harder time paying their bills, having a, a harder and harder time providing for their families. And this administration's policies, or, or perhaps some could say the, the lack thereof in certain areas, are making it even more difficult to provide for their families. And the economic resources are diminishing rapidly. With political unrest in the Middle East and North Africa, the summer travel season picking up in the coming months, and the additional rise in, in fuel costs that accompany it, accompany it, Americans, I believe, are anxiously awaiting for the administration's plan, for the plan to increase our fuel supply uh, and try to suppress price spikes or foreign supply disruptions. Whatever the cause is, the American people need to see the way out. What is the plan? So I'd like to ask a question for Mr. Newell, if you would. According to your agency, uh, production in the Gulf has declined by nearly 300,000 barrels a day since last April. There have been project declines of 250,000 barrels a day, uh, or will be for the next two years, continuing declines. Have you calculated how much in revenue via royalties the federal government and the producing Gulf states have lost? We've not done that calculation. That would uh, be the kind of calculation that the Department of Interior would do. We have not done that. Well, then let me ask perhaps um, Dr. Foss, if you would. Um, this year, or the, the President's fiscal year 2012 budget, the proposed budget, includes over $60 billion in new taxes and new fees for American energy production. 
If you couple that with the lag in getting permits approved in the Gulf, what we've been discussing uh, during this hearing, can you tell us what you, how you, what you believe what this will do to fuel prices and whether these actions will encourage or discourage companies to invest in American energy production? Anything that affects the cost of doing business, that full break-even finding and development costs that I mentioned in my testimony, um, will make the resources that are, that are recovered more expensive. Um, and the only way to, to offset that is to streamline other things, for example, the cost of, of, of obtaining permits or the cost of dealing with regulatory oversight or, or other actions and increase production volumes so that the cost can be spread over more barrels or more cubic feet of gas. Uh, anyone else like to elaborate? Perhaps uh, Mr. Caruso? Uh, no, I think the thing that um, in that budget that is likely to have a significant effect is the uh, increased costs by reducing or eliminating the intangible uh, drilling uh, permitting, uh, the ability to uh, uh, expense intangible drilling costs. I'm told from uh, the smaller independent oil and gas producers that that's going to have a significant uh, negative effect on their ability to drill uh, as much as their uh, their expectations uh, were. So I, I think that will, in the longer term, reduce U.S. production. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Utah, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the panel staying this long. I think I've outlasted everybody else here. Um, Ms. Pierce, I appreciate the conversation you had with Mr. Tipton of Colorado about oil shale. Uh, and I appreciate you saying that there were hundreds of billions or billions, I think you said, of barrels. Actually, if, if the Energy Department, your department, to believe there's 800 billions of barrels that could be recovered, that's much bigger than what Saudi Arabia has in proven reserves. It would create 100,000 jobs and about $2 billion in royalties which the state's share would do a great job in funding our state's education system. As we can tell, when the Secretary of the Interior uh, pulled, violating his process, 77 oil leases from there, it had a direct impact on the funding of education in my state as well. So I appreciate that comment. I do want to hit up Dr. Foss, if I could, with some questions. Um, uh, dealing with what we have talked about so far, because it's very clear that when gas prices go up, and heating prices go up, that becomes part of the collateral damage, oftentimes, of administrative decisions, especially lately. So I want to follow up with Ms. Mr. Rivera was talking about. In your opinion, which Americans are really the most impacted by rising gasoline prices? The Americans that spend the most money on gasoline relative to their disposable household incomes. So people who, who have a larger share of their, whole, their household budget having to go for gasoline purchases. That, that becomes the lower economic strata of our society then. I'm, I'm assuming that's lower. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it would be safe to say that if these Americans would be the ones who stand to benefit most from an increase in American-made oil and natural gas production, these would be the ones who we would be helping the most, I'm assuming. Yes, that's correct. We currently lease, let me stick with you, Dr. Foss, if I may. We currently lease less than 4% of the 2.5 billion acres of the federal mineral estate. If we were to allow access to more of that federal mineral estate, is it not logical we could increase our domestic reserve base? Yes, we would. You got to talk longer than this when I'm used to bigger answers, but thank you for the direction there. <laughs> What, what advantages does the United States have compared to other countries, or maybe even hindrances do we have to other countries, that uh, we might, in Congress, address that would encourage more domestic development? Well, I think the one that we just talked about, which is budgets and taxes, um, and, and there are two, two things to think about there. One is the direct effect on the producers themselves, the producing community itself. Um, so the tax structures they face, the cost structures they face. Um, but then the other one is the health of the overall economy because just like any other industry, any other business, companies will do better if the overall U.S. economy and budget are in better shape. 
Okay, I appreciate it. Let me ask just one last one of you then. Um, because we heard yesterday a, a, a great deal of comparisons between the United States and other countries that I think somewhat were skewed in, in the response of doing that. But how does the domestic oil and gas industry compare here, compare to the industry in other countries in terms of science or technological development? Um, it's, it's enormously different. Um, for one thing, we have thousands and thousands of producers of all sizes and shapes and, and specialties. Um, Anywhere from nine to ten thousand, nine thousand to ten thousand, I think, is, is still the rough estimate of, of the total number of active producers um, in the United States, large and small. Um, they're motivated to deploy and develop the best technologies that they can, and they try to do that. Um, and they do that freely in an open market and, and through competitive industry activity. Um, and they have access to private owned minerals and not just the, the public owned minerals. We're the only country that, that is organized that way. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, I also appreciate the fact, we've talked a lot about offshore development, but I come from an inland state that has a great deal of potential development if it were allowed to be there. And as somebody who is on a school teacher's retirement, my retirement is, the future of my retirement is based on the ability of the economy of my state to fund that, as well as my kids' education system. So I'm very sensitive when we make arbitrary decisions by this administration that takes that potential development off the table when we could be benefiting from that to table. Mr. Chairman, if I have a few minutes left, could I yield to the gentleman from Louisiana? If I have a few seconds left? The gentleman has uh, 19 seconds left. Do you want 19 uh, seconds, Jeff? No, okay. Turn your mic on, Jeff. I, I would like to just for the record uh, talk about the rig count in uh, real quickly. Uh, the rigs that are out there uh, that they're claiming are in the Gulf of Mexico, those rigs may not be drilling. Is that correct? So it doesn't do us any good to count a rig that's not drilling. Uh, it's correct. The rigs certainly could be there and not drilling. It, it, I guess it speaks to the, the longer term issue of how fast it could recover. And, and, and some, okay. Right. Time of the gentleman is expired. And there is a desire for second round, so I, I'll certainly recognize uh, the gentleman. Uh, gentleman from Utah's time has expired. There is a desire for a second round. I, um, I, I just have one question. I'll go to Mr. Holt and, and then f finish up with Mr. Landry. Uh, Dr. Foss, uh, there, there have been records that have been sent. You alluded to this in your opening statement between the price differential of the world Brent crude and, and the West Texas. and. The, the, the suggestion is, is because this has been the rise of or the impact of North Dakota. Uh, and I understand that new production probably would have an impact uh, on world prices. But isn't this difference in price an indication that more domestic production could provide a price break for American consumers in that regard, as well as the national security aspect that I've been talking about for some time? Dr. Foss? Yes. Uh, boy, that's very definitive. Do you want to elaborate just a moment? That's the, only, that's the only question I have, so I'm not going to ask you to, I'm not going to ask another one. I just, All right, well, I'm, and expl I just explain need to be briefly. i sure that I understand what you're, what you're asking, which is the, the impact of our crude production in our own markets. Right, exactly. Um, of course it has a huge impact. And, and I mentioned an idea, a suggestion that we need to think about, which is de-bottlenecking to make sure that we can benefit from it. Um, because... And we have this problem, we've had this problem before. We have it on the natural gas side periodically. We have new areas of production that grow and start flourishing. We have pipeline bottlenecks and storage bottlenecks and we can't really get it out into the market. So we have accumulation, we have an accumulation of inventory in one part of the country right now. And, and it's, 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 it's contributing to this disparity between our domestic price signal and um, the internationally traded Brent crude. So, um, to the extent that that provides an indication to investors that perhaps there's money to be made um, by building additional um, oil pipeline storage terminal and other uh, capacity, they'll, they'll get there as long as they can get it permitted um, and, and enter the market in a way that they, they feel will work timing-wise. And all that would be uh, based uh, on the uh, assumption uh, that it would be less than the world market prices, therefore benefiting American consumers. Is that correct? They would, they, well, they would, they would take advantage of arbitrage to make the investment work. Right. Um, 
So when you have a disparity in a price signal like this, um, a low price in a, in a producing area um, relative to higher prices in markets, that allows you to actually finance the infrastructure. Right. It's that basis differential, as we call it, um, that allows people to move forward with projects like new pipeline capacity and, and, and other debottlenecking strategies. Which goes back to your original... Benefit to consumers. Which goes back to your original uh, answer, short answer, yes, it help benefits the American consumer. I'll uh, yield back my time and recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Holt. I, I, thank, uh, I thank the chair and I thank him for his courtesy in allowing uh, further, further questioning. Um, uh, several of our colleagues raised the, uh, the point of the cost of uh, gasoline at the pump today, um, three and a half dollars and more uh, compared to months ago or a year ago. Um, but I think it's come out quite clearly uh, in the testimony today that oil prices are much more a function of what OPEC does uh, than a function of the rate of issuing or oil drilling permits. And gasoline prices are even less correlated with that. Gasoline price fluctuations are much more uh, a, a, a function of, of, of speculation and even what I would call gouging. Um, you know, wishing and hoping and dreaming won't change reality. Uh, you know, when we talk about uh, 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 reserves, I mean, that's reality. I mean, you know, it's what uh, resources that can be estimated with reasonable certainty to exist and be recoverable under reasonable economic conditions. Um, I, I think we have to face the fact that we must have a broader balance of, of, of an energy portfolio. Simplistic solutions won't do. Drill, baby, drill is simplistic. It does not capture what we have. We do not dominate the production of oil in the world. We never will again dominate the world oil production. The burn rate actually has some meaning. We can quibble about exactly where we are relative to Norway and others, but what it means is that our leverage in oil prices will be less and less and less, and it's already not great. So my question has to do with oil reserves, and not coal, by the way. You know, in, in, in talking about how many barrels equivalent we have of coal is not really relevant here today. Um, in trying to explain that the burn rate doesn't mean anything, uh, Ms. Dr. Foss says, well, but we're continuing to expand our knowledge of our reserves. My question is, when was the last time that more oil was discovered than was actually produced? In other words, when did this view of reserves around the world stop keeping up with our use of oil? Yes, do you know what year that was, uh, Dr. Foss? We always have more preserves than we, reserves than we have production. We produce from reserves. Uh, let me pretend we're playing Jeopardy here. That's been uh, uh, something that's been... The last year that more oil was discovered than was actually produced, what is 1984, more than a quarter of a century ago. You know, we can hope and dream and wish, but we've got to face facts. We can't look for simplistic solutions. We have to have a broader energy portfolio, and of course oil is important to Louisiana. Of course oil is important to Texas. Of course oil is important to all of our country for all sorts of reasons. But we can't change reality. And we've got to face facts. As Mr. Markey said early on, we've ridden this horse. And we've ridden this horse and the legs are given out. 
I yield back my time. Thank you. you the gentleman used back his time. Uh, I'll recognize Mr. Landry to uh, close. Mr. Landry. I, I think we have a few more horses in oil. We got natural gas. I would think Ms. Ross is a pretty solid horse, huh? Should put her in the in, in the in the gate. Uh, coal. We got a lot of coal. Put coal in the in the gate. And nuclear certainly uh, does a good job here in, in in this country. If we if if we could get back to building uh, refineries. I, and I'm confused. I know it's it's hard to sit right there, and there's a lot of confusion on the other side of the aisle because. They, they talk about OPEC having a stranglehold, and then, and then another member comes, come up, comes up and says that Exxon has a stranglehold. That, that's kind of confusing um, uh, to me as to who exactly has um, the, the stranglehold. Um, how long, any one of y'all, how long do you think that the, the, the trade of speculation has been around in this world? Come on, y'all smarter than me. Somebody knows. I mean, you want to guess? 100 years, 200 years? Uh, centuries. Centuries. So, so speculation of commodities has been around for centuries. So it evidently, and, and we've been able to grow. This country has been able to grow and prosper all the way through all of those evil speculators for centuries and centuries ago. They didn't hang them back then or anything. I, I, you know, do you know if, if they did or not? Was there any... Punishment for speculation? No? I don't believe so. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> what bothers me is we always want everybody else to increase their production capacity for our gain. But we don't want to take responsibility for what we could do ourselves. It, the interim safety rule issued by the Interior Department in October 14th of 2010 said that there is sufficient spare capacity in OPEC to offset the decreases in the Gulf of Mexico's deep water production. Do y'all believe that's true? I mean, if that's the case, then prices shouldn't be continuing to go up. Wow. Well, well, let me ask you this question. Any of y'all familiar with water cut? Any of y'all familiar with the Middle East reserves out there? Uh, any, any, anyone want to comment? Or, or I, I, look, I'm going to give y'all the floor. I got some time here. Mr. Guy? I'm not sure what the question is. Well, well, could you, could, if you're familiar with the problems, because the Middle East, we always want to turn to the Middle East, but isn't it true that the Middle East really has a problem with its spare capacity? The, every time the United States asks the, 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 the Middle East, or Saudi Arabia in particular, to increase its spare capacity, doesn't that put pressure on Saudi's reserves such that it, it actually damages the reserves rather than, 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 incre than, than allows for longevity of those reserves? My experience is that they manage their reserves uh, pretty efficiently. But so Ms. I, don't, I don't have any evidence that they're damaging. Ms. Ross? I, th I think, and, and, um, and I think that many other people would agree, including all of our colleagues at EIA, um, that one of the more difficult estimates to put together is that estimate of spare capacity. Um, in, among the OPEC producing countries. Right. And I think that that's actually one of the things that contributes a great deal of uncertainty in, in the oil markets themselves. And what, what potential does the United States have to create spare capacity here at home, domestically? We have a great deal of, of capacity to do that because, again, it's about portfolios. It's the portfolios of opportunities that that are available to companies on both public and private lands. And to the extent that those portfolios of opportunities are robust, that's our spare capacity. The gentleman, you. Yes. Uh, on the issue of speculation, I don't know if the gentleman does grocery shopping in his family or not. Uh, but uh, I would guess that your, uh, your wife, at, from time to time, will buy a two at the price of one. Would you consider that speculating? No, I was, 
That's smart shopping. Right. But, but, the, the, but, it, makes, but it makes the point. I would guess that your wife is making that purchase because you're speculating, speculating the next time she would buy that product, the price would go up. So she's speculating on keeping it down. I mean, that, when people, one talks about speculation, uh, if you put it in the terms like that, we do that every day uh, in our lives. You buy a jumbo instead of the other. Why? Because you're speculating that that price is different, uh, differential. So that's why uh, apparently you don't do the shopping. No, but she does. She does right. smart shopping. Okay, she she buys two for one. <laughs> Time of the gentleman has expired. A gentleman from California is recognized, and I give the courtesy to him. Uh, we, we said we were going to close with Mr. Landry, but certainly if the gentleman wants to have uh, time, he's uh, certainly recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I, I do appreciate that. I know it's been a long hearing, but it's been an important hearing, and I thank you for putting it together. <clears throat> you know, it's been six years since I've been on this committee, and uh, we've obviously had this discussion and debate throughout those six years. And um, I find it interesting that we all use the same facts, uh, more or less, uh, but obviously uh, using those facts come to different conclusions. And um, and it's interesting, we come to different conclusions even though we want, in essence, the same goals. The same goals that we want are as a, uh, uh, a cleaner, uh, more reliable uh, sources, I say sources of energy for our nation that will be economically viable, that will reduce over the years our dependency on foreign sources of energy. We want the same goals. Um, and it seems what's lacking to me is, is is how we can agree in a bipartisan fashion on how we obtain that goal. Um, and it's not that we're lacking for plans. Uh, since 1973, I remember clearly when President Nixon, uh, we experienced the first energy uh, uh, gas lines where people, you know, we had even odd days to <laughs> get your gas, and uh, announced a plan then that would, uh, it was called energy independence. I'm not so sure that we, ever truly are going to be independent, but certainly everybody believes that we should, ought to reduce our dependency on foreign sources. At that time, we were importing 30% of our energy as foreign sources. And since that time, every president and numerous congresses have all had energy proposals, our plans that in some fashion or another have been implemented. And of course, we've gone from 30% of our energy sources being imported to now almost 60% or more of our energy sources. So you have to sit back for a moment and say, w since we want the same goals, what's, and, and we've all had a lot of plans out there, what's been lacking? And I'll tell you what I think's been lacking is a ability for any Congress or any administration to reach a consensus on a short-term, interim, and long-term energy policy that in fact will fulfill those goals of, of, of dealing with the new technologies, reducing our, so, uh, our dependency on foreign sources of energy, and sticking with the plan. We can't stick with any plan. I mean, our plans, uh, you know, they're, they're the, the plan du jour, the plan for the day. I mean, we have a plan for this year, two years, three years, we change it, energy prices go up, makes certain alternatives more economically viable, energy prices go down, it makes less energy uh, alternatives viable. And, and we have this kind of circular browbeating of one another uh, that at the end of the day doesn't help the American public nor a long-term energy plan. Mr. Caruso, what do you think in using all the energy tools in our energy toolbox, because I don't think there is a silver bullet out there. I think that we've got to use all of them. I've always maintained that for the six years I've been there. How do we do a transition and adopt a plan in the near term with more reliance clearly on our fossil fuels and the interim as we transition to a longer term policy, and I define longer term 20 years and out, um, to reach the sort of near term and long term goals that our country needs to, I think, uh, achieve and we ought to be focusing on a bipartisan basis. Uh, I mean, when do we do an inventory of what our current energy needs are, when, when, what they're going to be in the, 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 the midterm and the longer term, and, and, and how do we use the different energy tools in the energy toolbox to transition? I think you're absolutely right about the time frame. We need to be thinking 
decades long transition. Fossil fuels are going to be with us for a long time to come. And the alternatives, for a variety of reasons, technology, economics, scalability, are going to take a long time to develop. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't start, as you are alluding to. And on that side, the focus should be on technological development and innovation through research and development. I mean, that's, that's the long term. In the but on the short term, on part of that, conservation is low-hanging fruit. In I mean, in California and renewables, we're 20 yeah. percent, trying to get to 30 percent by the year 2020. In the short term, as I mentioned in the opening statement, that uh, vehicle efficiency, improvements in efficiency in homes, the use of uh, co-generated electric, there's a lot of things that can be done to reduce demand. So I think we need to do it all and not think it's going to happen overnight. So I think there's been a unrealistic expectations created by all of us, including us energy experts. <laughs> We've time, time well, thank gentlemen. you, Mr. Chairman, for the time and, and allowing us and, and to sum things up, so to speak. And uh, I look forward to working with you on these important issues. I, I, I thank the gentleman very much. And uh, I want to thank uh, this panel. It's been uh, over three hours since we convened this. And I, I, and I especially, I really mean, I, I especially uh, appreciate the brevity. In fact, we've been kicking around some ideas here of what we're going to call it. It could be the As Time Goes By Award, the Once Upon a Time Award or the Good Time Award, I mean, whatever it is, uh, I will say that this pal panel here today on St. Patrick's Day is the recipient of that award. So thank you very much, and the committee will stand adjourned. Yesterday, the House voted to eliminate federal funding for NPR. We'll show you that debate in a moment. And on this morning's Washington Journal,